I call this meeting of the Shirt Sibo Universal City Independent School Dis District to order. Let the record show that a quorum of board members is present, that the meeting has been duly mm -hmm. called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The time is 6 o'clock. Roll call. Mr. President, we have six members present. Mr. Finley, Vice President Finley, is not here this evening. Thank you. Recognition items. Recognition students leading the Pledge of Allegiance. Sure, we'll move right to that, sir. Either. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the board, um, we have some fine students uh, from SCUCISD making their way to the front. Uh, we are joined uh, by a couple of fine young men this, uh, this evening. Uh, from Sippel Elementary, uh, we have, I'm sorry, excuse me, from Schlother Intermediate, we have Takari Freeman, uh, who will be introduced by his interim principal for the next few days, uh, Veronica Goldhorn. Uh, and we have Braden Ray, very special young man to us all here, uh, fourth grader at Sippel. He'll be introduced by his principal, Corey Bristow. Ms. Goldhorn. Good evening, members of the board, President Perkins and Superintendent Dr. Ely. I'm Veronica Goldhorn, Director of Elementary and Intermediate Education, and I'm representing Yvette Ross, our principal at Schlother Intermediate. I would like to introduce to you Schlother student representative Dakari Hamilton. He is a sixth grader and the Schlother Student Council president. Dakari exemplifies the traits of a graduate of a skilled communicator. Dakari loves to meet people and says that learning about people is so much fun and he certainly gets good practice in his leadership role on campus. Dakari's favorite subject is science. In his free time, Dakari enjoys playing video games, football, and talking to people. Dakari is joined by his mother tonight, Mrs. Hamilton. If you'll please stand and be recognized. I would like to introduce Brayden Ray, a fourth grader from Sippel Elementary. I serve as his proud principal and want to highlight his leadership both at school and in the community. Braden serves on our safety patrol at Sippel and greets students and staff and visitors on our campus every morning when our doors open at 7 a.m. From early morning until evening, such as now, he shares his passion for helping others to include his family and his teammates on his soccer team. Braden is the youngest player to ever be selected under the SAFC Pro Academy. Very proud of him for that. And from the Greenhouse of Courage, also known as Isabindi, here is Brayden and Dakari, and they'll be teaming up to lead our pledges this evening. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Next, we have the president's welcome. It, it's, it, I think we've learned anything in this this last almost two years is the importance of educating children and educating in person. And then we're struggling with it, but we're 
getting through it, and we're and I'm we're so proud of all of you for putting in the effort and and making it work, and all of our students for being here and doing what they can. Thank you all very much, and let's keep up the fight. Next is Vice President's recitation of district mission, vision, values, and priorities. Mr. Finley can't be here tonight, so I'm going to read off the mission, vision, values for our district. Our motto, a district with passion and purpose. Our mission, SCUC ISD, a diverse community founded in trust and transparency, commits to empower all students to fulfill lifelong potential through inspiring learning experiences. Our vision, inspire, innovate, excel. Values, leadership, character, commitment, service, and learning. Our priorities, there are four of them. One, all graduates will be college and or career and or military ready. Two, high performing and engaged workforce. Three, highly satisfied students, parents, and community. And four, efficient district and campus operations. Thank you, Ms. Seaver. Next, we have board recitation of district belief statements. We believe all students have the capacity to learn and excel. We believe a safe, secure, and supportive environment is paramount to learning. We believe in living our core values of leadership, character, commitment, service, and learning. We believe engaging, interactive, and authentic teaching creates empowered, inspired leaders prepared for a changing world. We believe, we believe technology is a relevant tool that enhances learning in and beyond the classroom. We believe in professional learning communities um, that fosters collaborative continuous improvement. We believe, ah, oh, oops, sorry. <laughs> we believe in transparent, clear, and timely communication among all of citizens and guests. We believe most Thank you, board members. Robert, if you need to borrow my glasses next time, you're welcome. <laughs> next, we have Vice President's Overview of Good Governance Indicators and Board Member Ethics. Each month, we highlight um, our board member ethics. This month, um, we will be highlighting honor and conduct. As board members, as members of the board, I'm sorry. As a member of the board, we shall promote the best interest of the district as a whole and to that end shall adhere to the following ethical standards. I will tell the truth. I will share my views while working for consensus. I will respect the majority decision as the decision of the board. I will base my decisions on fact rather than supposition, opinion, or public favor. Thank you, Ms. Siever. Next. Item A, recognition items, recognition of student representatives of the month of January, Dr. E. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. We are joined again with two fabulous students from our two comprehensive high schools, uh, Samuel Clemens and Byron Steele, uh, as the student representatives of the month of January. I do not know who won the flip uh, at the beginning to decide who's going first. So as Ms. Rebeck and Ms. Sirzati look at each other, who's going first? Welcome to the podium, please, Principal of Samuel Clemens High School, Mrs. Amy Sirazadi, uh, as she introduces to us um, her great student, Lauren Hine. Thank you, Ms. Rebeck, for yielding. It's my pleasure, board and um, executive staff, Dr. Ely, to introduce Lauren Hine. She is a junior at Samuel Clemens High School who has been in the district for 12 years. Over the past three years at Samuel Clemens, she has been in many organizations such as Color Guard with the band and our Taffy organization. During the 2021 school year, Lauren was one of the Color Guard lieutenants. She is currently serving as the Color Guard captain as well as the president of the Taffy Texas Association of Future Educators. Lauren attended the 2021 Educators Rising National Conference where she competed in two events, impromptu speaking and impromptu lessons. She placed second and fourth respectively and plans on competing again this year. Lauren is preparing for college by taking classes such as Ready, Set, Teach and focusing on extracurricular activities and schoolwork. 
Ready, Set, Teach is helping her prepare for her future in education. After graduation, Lauren plans to attend Texas State University, where she plans to major in education and eventually earn her doctorate in education. Lauren is the daughter of Matthew and Jennifer Hyde. If you could please stand, be recognized. <laughs> Lauren serves Taffy under the direction of Ms. Wendy Frisbee, our sponsor. She is also the little sister to a recent Clemens graduate, Matt. We appreciate everything that you do, and this incredible young woman is leading our staff, our, excuse me, our future staff of teaching. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Ely and members of the board. My name is Lauren Hine, and I'm a junior from Santa Clemens High School. Thank you for letting me present to you all this evening. I'm here to talk about an organization that is near and dear to my heart. TAFI, or Texas Association of Future Educators, is an amazing club to grow the minds of future educators. We compete in competitive events that are specialized to different parts of being an educator. Some of these events are interactive bulletin boards, project visualize, portfolio, and lesson plan. Personally, I compete in two of these events, impromptu speaking and impromptu lesson. The reason I continue to compete in these events and have such success is that I've had many things that have helped me, such as RST, Ready, Set, Teach, or Practicum Course. It's a two-year program at Clemens where students get to basically student teach all year. I'm in a wonderful kindergarten classroom where I am learning all about what it takes to be a teacher. It has been amazing to not only get to see the highs, but also the lows of being an educator. Another thing that's helped me is being the captain of the color guard. Being the captain has taught me that the best way to lead is by owning up to mistakes and learning how to fix them for next time. Also watching other great leaders and learning from them. Our director, Hannah, is such an amazing role model for all of us on the team, and having her as a mentor has been one of the best learning experiences of my life. On a daily basis, she shows what I believe to be the three best leadership characteristics, positivity, kindness, and humbleness. I am a very visual and kinesthetic learner, so not only getting to see these things, but learning how to use them in the real world has been so amazing. It has also helped me in other aspects of my life, like in Taffy. Since I do speaking events, it is crucial to go into it with lots of confidence and positivity. It's all about making good points and presenting it in an interesting and sequential way to get your point across to the judges. This strategy helped me get second and fourth in nationals last year. Our fabulous sponsor, Ms. Frisbee, who for the past three years has been such an amazing role model, embodies what it means to be a teacher. She is always working her hardest to make sure her students are set up to be the most successful that they can be. She does this for the Taffy Club year after year, and we owe our success to her. Thank you so much for letting me talk to y'all this evening. Have a nice night. Thank you, Lauren. And would you please welcome to the podium Deborah Rebeck, Assistant Principal at Byron Steel High School, as she will uh, introduce to us uh, the Steel Representative Mariana Williams. Good evening, Dr. Ely, President Perkins, and the members of the board. My name is Deborah Rebeck, Assistant Principal at Steele High School. I am proud to present to you Mariana Williams, who is representing the FCCLA program. Mariana's family is with us tonight. Please stand to be recognized. Ms. Jana Mahoney, our FCCLA director, could not unfortunately be with us this evening, but she gives her love to Mariana, she loves her. Mariana is a junior who currently serves as our FCCLA president. She has been the president for the last two years. She has also been the region officer for FCCLA for two years and served as VP of membership and is currently the region five president. She was a member of the SEAL volleyball team and has been a two year varsity wrestler. Mariana moved to Cibolo when she was four years old and has been in the SBUC school district since Watts Elementary. After graduation, Mariana would like to attend A&M in Corpus Christi to pursue a bachelor's of science degree in nursing and would like to become a nurse midwife. I now present to you Mariana Williams. Good evening, Dr. Ely and President Perkins and the members of the board. 
My name is Mariana Williams and I am a junior at Byron Peekskill High School. In my three years, I have been an active member and still FCCLA, holding a leadership position for all of them. FCCLA stands for Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America. We are a student-led nonprofit organization with family as its central focus. Um, we provide we provide members with opportunities for personal growth and leadership development through national programs that promote community service, physical wellness, and personal growth. Star event competitions, leadership trainings, and workshops to teach etiquette and proper communication and public speaking skills. Through FCCLA, I've had, I've had the opportunity to develop my leadership skills, prepare for my future, and network with students across the nation. I've held two regional offices, including Vice President of Membership, and this year being the Re Region 5 President. Holding this position is an honor, but comes with a lot of work, yet it is very rewarding. In two weeks from now, my officer team and myself will be hosting a conference for over 6,000 students in our region. We planned this entire event this summer at a leadership camp where we worked on public speaking, writing memos, and organizing events. Steel FCCLA will be taking eight teams to this leadership conference. They are showcasing our awesome chapter, culinary, and projects that promote literacy. Steel FCCLA is very active on campus and in the district. We partner up with the community and schools to help to help out and plan Gold Santa. We also host the mother-son event and the daddy-daughter dance. The profit raised from the daddy-daughter dance is all donated to a local charity. While my life has changed, while my life has been changed by FCCLA, which equipped me for tools necessary to be a successful leader and a young adult, none of my success would have been possible without my, without my amazing advisor, Jana Mahoney, and SCUC ISD. SCUC ISD has supported FCCLA Steel FCCLA by helping offset costs for competitions and conferences where our chapters compete in events such as chapter and review, community chapter service project, and culinary. Provided, they have also provided us with a platform for advocacy within our community and graciously allowed us to grow our chapter and promote organization by hosting countless community service events. Our chapter has also had numerous star events and national and has sorry, <laughs> numerous star events national champions, regional officers, and scholarship recipients, and even a project on nutrition and wellness to be being presented to the, U United, to the United States Food and Drug Administration by FCCLA national officer in Washington, D.C. Steele High School and students of FCS classes are truly grateful to have the opportunity to be part of a CTSA that works hard to encourage the success of its members and students of a district of a district who provides opportunities for all students to excel in not only academics, but extra and co-curricular activities as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, Mariana, Lauren, and uh, Ms. Rebeck, and Ms. Sergei, could you all come up here? Our next recognition item is also Dr. Ely School Board Recognition Month. Hey, we get to recognize y'all. <laughs> um, Governor Greg Abbott has declared January 2022 as School Board Recognition Month as a tribute to the hardworking school board members who play such an important role in our communities and schools. In addition, the Texas Association of School Boards encourages all school districts to recognize their boards of trustees. Uh, TASB encourages district to focus on the crucial role that the trustees hold. They're extraordinary people who voluntarily tackle the enormous job of governing school districts. Uh, their actions not only affect the lives of the kids who are in school today, but those who will be coming after them and all of their futures. Uh, before we uh, go through our presentation, I just would like to say, just uh, on behalf of myself and the administration, I thank all seven of you. I'm sorry Mr. Finley is not here to hear this this evening. Uh, I thank you for the amazing role that you play in this school district. Um, uh, what, 
the things that you and the audience and at home don't see is the hours upon hours that they spend preparing uh, to for, for these monthly meetings, uh, for workshops, uh, for budget preparation, uh, as they, and as they just learn the many things uh, that are associated with running such a large organization like a public school system. Uh, this board has traditionally, and this one in particular, uh, has an eye for governance and uh, is a and works very hard and works on the right things. And, and those are student performance uh, and ensuring the success of the entire school system, our employees, and our families. So I just want to thank you for what you do. Uh, we have a tradition here in SCUC ISD that in honor of your service, uh, we have uh, students at our campuses pick out library books uh, and we'll donate them to their school libraries in honor of you. So. Um, now, I'm going to stop because I don't know exactly what we're going to do. It's like Thanksgiving. Somebody's going to tell us where to go, but I think we have to go down there. Oh. Our first campus is Cibolo Valley Elementary. Our principal is Rhonda Young-Michael, and I'll be representing Mrs. Young-Michael this evening. Our student from Cibolo Valley is Christopher Stepaniak, who is a third grade student, and he'll be dedicating his book to Mrs. Letitia Seaver. Parents, as we uh, go through this process, if you would like to get up and come up here and take pictures, you're more than welcome, parents. Our next student is, um, our campus is Green Valley Elementary. Our principal is Miss Amy Denman. And our student from Green Valley is Sean Brown, who is a fourth grade student. And he'll be dedicating his book to our board member, Robert Westbrook. Our next campus is Pasco Elementary. Our next campus is Pasco Elementary. Our principal is Allison Miller. Our student is Faith Denner, who is a fourth grade student and will be dedicating her book to Gerald Perkins. Our next campus is Watts Elementary. Our interim principal is Amanda Gonzalez, and um, we have our student Luke Zimmerman, who is a third, uh, who is a fourth grade student, and will be dedicating his book to Edward Finley, who is not present, but Dr. Ely will be taking his place and representing.
Our next student of uh, our campus is Wiederstein Elementary. Our principal is Ashley Hawk, and I'll be representing Miss um, Ashley Hawk this evening. Our student is Levi Menchaca, who is a third grade student, and he'll be dedicating his book to Mr. Dan Swarth. Next is Rose Garden Elementary. Our principal is Sarah Reed. Our student is Hannah Nance, and she is a fourth grade student who will be dedicating her book to our board member, Belinda Evans. Our next campus is Schertz Elementary. Our principal is Jerry Pope. Our student is Emily Mather, who is a third grade student, and she'll be dedicating her book to Mrs. Amy Thomas. Next, we have Sippel Elementary. Our principal is Clary Bristow. Our student is Brayden Ray, who is a fourth grade student and will be dedicating his book to Letitia Seaver. Next is Jordan Intermediate. Our school principal is Tina Curtis, and our student is Dejan Allen Armstrong, who is a fifth grade student at Jordan, and he will be dedicating his book to Mrs. Belinda Evans. Next, we have Wilder Intermediate. Our school principal is Sarah Dauphiné. Our student is not present this evening. Her name is Micah Mueller, who is a sixth grader and will be dedicating her book to Mrs. Amy Thomas. And our last of our intermediate school is Schlother Intermediate. Our principal is Yvette Ross. She could not be present this evening, so I'll be representing for uh, Mrs. Ross. Our student is Dakari Hamilton, who is the sixth grader and will be dedicating his book to Edward Finley. Next up, we have Doby Junior High, Principal Vernon Simmons, and our student tonight, or this evening, Samantha Coast, eighth grader at Doby, will be presenting to Mrs. Amy Thomas. Next, we have Corbett Junior High, Principal Rashad Ray, with student Hayden, Hayden Wallen, eighth grader, presenting to Mr. Gerald Perkins.
Next up from Allison Steele Enhanced Learning Center, we have Principal Mr. Joey Trevino presenting this evening uh, Ms. Tara Johnson, 11th grader, and is presenting to Mr. Robert Westbrook. From Byron Steele High School, Principal Janner Cervantes, uh, representing tonight Assistant Principal Mrs. Deborah Rebreck, Mariana Williams, 11th grader, presenting to Mr. Ed Finley, who will be presenting to Dr. Ely. From Clemens High School, Principal Mrs. Amy Sarazati, Mrs. Lauren Hahn, 11th grader, presenting to Mr. Gerald Perkins. From our 18 plus campus, teachers Molly Cordova and Daria Wallen, representing this evening Daria Wallen and student Anna Garcia Villasenor will be presenting to Mrs. Leticia Saver. From our DAP campus, we have Principal Ms. Stacy Cerna, who will be presenting to Mr. Dan Seward. Swart. Dan Swart, I'm sorry. And at this time, all those that took in individual pictures, if you'd come up, we'd like to take a group picture at this time. And at this time, we'd like to recognize all of our parents who came this evening uh, who brought their children to be recognized for our school board appreciation. So thank you to our parents. If you could please stand if you're not already standing.
next recognition item is recognition of school res resource officers. National Law Enforcement Day, January 9th, 2022, presented by Ernie Reynolds. Just wanted to let you know if you're, you are more than welcome to leave if you were here for your kiddo, um, but you're also welcome to stay. Good evening, President Perkins, members of the board, and Dr. Ely. On Sunday, January 9th, 2022, members in all communities across the country showed their appreciation and support by celebrating National Law Enforcement Day. This day highlights our law enforcement personnel who serve every day in the line of duty and shine a light on a selfless of law enforcement and their loved ones. Not only do they serve and protect, but these individuals of law enforcement also solve solidify communities and uphold order in areas we as citizens often overlook. This evening, we'd like to recognize the excellent student resource officers that work in our schools. Representing their agencies are from the Schertz Police Department. We have Interim Chief Mark Bain. <laughs> Officer Greg Flowers. Officer Frank Schmidt. <laughs> Officer Richard Kuntz. <laughs> and from the Cibolo Police Department, we have Sergeant Romero Balderas. <laughs> On behalf of the students and staff of Shirt Cibolo Universal City ISD, we would like to extend our appreciation for your dedication and service. Next we have Mr. President, if yes. I, if I mo uh, for the uh, uh, the resource officers, are, as a fellow first responder, I really do appreciate it. So this past weekend, I had an opportunity to speak with a, uh, a board member from Vendor ISD. And we were talking about the importance of uh, school resource officers and, and law enforcement on the campus, uh, whether you're a school resource officer or you're an employee of the district, um, you're on the front lines. Um, because of your relationship building, many times you're the first to sort of sort of see that when a student is in need, and so you're a part-time counselor, and you serve many roles more than just law enforcement. So I really do appreciate all the hard work and putting yourself um, 
in that situation. Thank you very much. Um, but I do, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell y'all that the reason why God invented firefighters was so that y'all would have heroes to look up to. <laughs> uh, but other than that, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> He who has the mic last. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have curriculum celebration awareness recognitions presented by Serena Georges Penny. Good evening. Good evening, President Perkins, Dr. Ely, and members of the board. First up, we're going to recognize Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. On the third Monday in January each year, we take a moment to honor the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This year, Americans will honor Dr. King on January 17th, the date of the federal holiday commemorating the civil rights era. As a Nobel Peace Prize recipient, Dr. King had a seismic impact on race relations in the 1950s and continues to be remembered as one of the most influential and inspirational leaders in history. From reading about Dr. King's life and work to listening to his speeches and diving deeply into his writings, to envisioning a better world based on his ideas and values, SCU TISD students will be learning about his life, the impact he made on the civil rights movement, and his significance to American culture and history. In remembrance of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we will end this recognition with the following quote by Dr. King. The function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the true goal of education. Next up, we have recognition of Holocaust remembrances. With the passage of Senate Bill 1828, Texas Holocaust Remembrance Week was established during the week of January 27 by the governor's office in order to honor the liberation of the Auschwitz extermination camp by the Allied forces. The goal of Texas Holocaust Remembrance Week is to educate students about the Holocaust and inspire in students a sense of responsibility to recognize and uphold human value and to prevent future atrocities. For the, week out, for the week outlined in House Bill 3257, teachers have been provided with access to resources from the Holocaust Memorial Museum of San Antonio. These are free resources approved by the Texas Holocaust Genocide and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission. The learning and discussions on the Holocaust will vary depending on the expectation in our Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills or TEAT, as well as the grade level appropriateness. In, com in commemoration of the Holocaust, we will end this recognition with a quote from Anne Frank that reads, how wonderful it is that nobody need waste a single moment before starting to improve the world. Thank you very much. Next we have public comments. And I do have one. Board of Trustees. The Board of Trustees will now hear public comments. In order to provide consistency and fairness to all individuals, public comments will be heard in accordance with board policy BED local and procedures outlined in administrative reg regulation BED. Comments should be limited to topics such as policies, curriculum, and facilities. Any direct criticism of a specific employee will not be heard during public comments and should be considered separately as provided in board policy. In this context, individuals are cautioned not to identify any employee by name or by any combination of words or descriptions which would identify the employee to another individual. Public comments will be limited to invi individuals who signed up to participate in public comment portion of the meeting before the board meeting was called to order. An individual who signs up to participate in the public comment portion of the meeting may not relinquish their time to another individual. No public comment shall exceed three minutes. To ensure compliance with this time limitation, a yellow card will be held up by the board secretary at two minutes and a red card will be held up at three minutes. We have one who signed up, that is Jennifer Hegwer.
make sure that it's on the screen. Yeah, it's on. Okay. Um, I just wanted to state, um, I'm just going to make this really quick because I don't want to backtrack on what a wonderful job you guys have done and the decisions that you have made in this district. Um, the only thing that I'm feeling as a parent cur currently is the pressure of answers. We don't know exactly, I mean, we knew the whole mask thing, you already know where I stand on that, wasn't, isn't the answer to say all to everything. So we want answers on some of the things that we're doing as a district outside of the box. We want to be the, we want to see the leaders. We want to see that our district is the one making the steps. We're not just following Bear County or Kamau County. We want to look outside the box of reasons and ways to help our school district. And right now across the Texas, across our school board, we're hearing teachers desperately asking for help, subs being an issue, t uh, bus drivers being an issue. What can we do outside the box? We as parents, do we need to make a committee? Do we need to do something to come up with ideas, starting school later to open up some availability or earlier? I think that's right. You know, anything, postponing some of the bus driving, the, the pass for the bus drivers, do we need to take it out to a, a mile and a half out? Or, I mean, just different things. I don't know what the answers are. I wish I did. I wish you, I know you guys wish you knew the answers, but I'm just saying that there is chatter. We want some information and just kind of where we're going, just in general, not masks aren't the at, and like the say all to everything. And that was the big umbrella earlier when that's not the answer. Answer is what can we do as a community to help our teachers? And that's where we kind of want to go at this point. And just wanted to kind of put my two cents out there if you all have any ideas that something we can do as parents. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you for your continued interest in education and participation. Next, we have superintendent's update, January update presented by Dr. Ingram. Uh, thank you, Mr. Perkins, members of the board. I uh, do have a little bit of an update of, of where we are here um, uh, as of January 18th, 2022. Um, as was just uh, referenced, COVID continues to be a challenge uh, for us. It's a challenge. Um, it's, it's a challenge in, uh, in having enough kids come to school and staff uh, being here and bus drivers and child nutrition. Uh, and you know it continues we continue to work through that uh, I am somewhat pleased to report that our high water mark for total cases was achieved yesterday at 642 uh, it has come down slightly today to 593 uh, so as of this afternoon we had 494 students uh, which represents 3.1 percent of our students uh, who are COVID positive as of this time and in isolation and 99 staff members uh, out of our 1,850, which is 5.4% of our staff that are in isolation at this time. We know that other students uh, are not here, and we do know that especially that other staff members uh, have had to be absent. They're having to be absent because they're caring for a family member or they potentially have been close contact. Um, we, we uh, on, the, on the testing front, we started the semester with 800 tests that were provided by the department provided by the Department of State Health Services. Uh, as you recall, that first week of January, uh, the community started running out of tests. We were able to provide tests, 800 of them, and that unfortunately only lasted us seven days uh, with the number of staff members and students who came up to be tested at that time. So we are now still uh, looking for additional tests as everybody is at this point. Um, we are doing a lot of monitoring. Every morning we're looking at the number of teachers, bus drivers, and other critical staff uh, that are out at the beginning of the day. We're looking at the number of sub requests that are unfilled, which needs, uh, which necessitates teachers having to cover classes uh, or double up uh, or combine classes. At the end of the day, we're looking at the student attendance rate. Our student attendance rate's been running from the mid 80s to 90% uh, over the last week to week and a half. Uh, other numbers though have not been uh, so good. Um, the, uh, we've been asked, do we have a certain metric that will trigger the closing of a school? And we do not. Um, when we will have to close a school or a grade level or a class will be when we cannot adequately staff that. We've been able to do so, uh, although it's been tough. Um, but we get to a point uh, that we cannot do that. We'll have to look at a particular campus or grade level. Um, I, I'll, in all honesty, I doubt we'll do the entire district um, because just the size we are, and how the, the virus migrates through the district. 
Um, through all this, we've had a tremendous uh, number of successes as well. Uh, I look at our faculty and staff uh, who were taxed and already having to cover classes and continue to step in, and they are continuing to step in uh, and help whenever needed. Uh, we have central office staff that are now on campus as well daily helping out, uh, and we are uh, working with our um, substitute system uh, to uh, with our new folks, uh, helpers, helpers, with our uh, new folks that are coming alongside us, our partners, uh, ESS, uh, to increase our number of substitutes. Um, we do know that, that the overall number of substitutes in the district is not where it needs to be, and we have looked at ways to incentivize this. One of the ways that we did was, was move to this uh, a partnership with ESS. Uh, the executive leadership team met today to consider other options to help with substitute uh, teachers and I am uh, excited tonight uh, to announce that beginning next Monday the 24th we are going to have new substitute rates uh, effective on that date. Uh, for certified teachers, uh, nurses, and LVNs the current rate of 90 will be moved up to $125 a day. Uh, for those same certified teachers, uh, RNs or LVNs, if they substitute on a Monday or a Friday, uh, that will be $150 a day. Uh, for those who are not certified but degreed, uh, it will move from $85 a day to $115 a day. Uh, those degreed individuals who, t who substitute on a Monday or Friday will be paid $140 a day. For those who have 60 plus college hours, uh, that current r the current rate is 75. It will move up to 105 a day for those who, uh, with 60 plus college hours, uh, who are on a Monday or a Friday, will move up from 85 a day to 130 a day. And from our paraprofessionals uh, who were $70 a day, they move up to 80 on Mondays and Fridays. They move from 80 to 90. We are enacting these changes. Uh, we are amending our contract with ESS. Uh, I know a bunch of people are probably writing stuff down. We will be able to. Uh, uh, we've don't worry, we'll be getting all this information out. Uh, in fact, to our ESS folks, we'll be getting out that to them tomorrow so they can help uh, that information as they continue with substitute recruitment. Uh, I do want to say that this is through the end of the school year, so end of the last day of instruction uh, of spring uh, 2022. Uh, as we go through the spring semester and we make decisions and we look at staffing and budgeting for next year, this will be something that will be in there just like salary increases, just like benefit increases, just like uh, additional positions and everything else that we will consider. Uh, so uh, we feel good that we were able to do this. It brings us in uh, right at the same level with many of the other um, districts that we are in competition with uh, for substitute teachers. So as I said, we'll be getting more information out to that uh, to parents and community members and uh, to our campuses uh, starting tomorrow. Um, it is January, and not only are we dealing with COVID, not only are we, uh, uh, not only are we recognizing our board members uh, for a, a um, for Board Appreciation Month, we're doing a whole lot uh, more other things as well in addition to that. So, talking about the board, uh, the board came together. All seven of us, in fact, a team of eight, myself included, spent 12 hours uh, together in board training last week. That was uh, all day Friday and half day Saturday. Uh, with the Schlecky Center uh, for School Improvement. We were able to work with five other boards of trustees and senior leadership uh, and learn a lot about doing just what we're doing tonight, and that's taking uh, challenges and turning them into opportunities uh, and working on leading through uh, the difficulties that we have to face. And I just want to say thank you to all seven board members uh, and their families who made the sacrifice and the commitment to be there. Uh, of the six boards that were there, we were the only one that was represented by uh, every single board member, and I think that says a lot about you and your commitment to the school district. Uh, tonight's going to be a big night. We're going to be selecting our group to help facilitate our strategic planning process that will be occurring this spring uh, and into the summer. Uh, we'll be selecting a new chief financial officer. We'll be saying goodbye shortly uh, to Mr. Prusky, uh, who has served this district with distinction for 28 years. Uh, and as CFO since 2019, but we're excited to be able to uh, look at who will be able to come and help us as a district moving forward. Um, and as we are working as a, as a unit, as a team, to update our enrollment and campus capacity projections uh, based on our annual demographic report, report our third quarter report, uh, we'll be sharing that information out to the combined community um, advisory committee. That meeting is scheduled for uh, Wednesday, uh, February the 2nd, Groundhog Day. 
uh, and we are planning on an elected leaders luncheon, and that it will be three weeks after CCAC, and that would be on Wednesday, uh, February the 23rd. Look for more information from us uh, about that. And finally, as I talked a little bit about budgeting and staffing, we're setting the stage for that uh, as we work through uh, the, the various challenges that we have for next year. And that will take up a lot of our time uh, as a team of eight and as an administration. So with that, that concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Ely. Any questions? Please don't ask me to repeat all the numbers. I don't see any. <laughs> <laughs> Time's up. <coughs> Next, we have progress monitoring report on the following district priorities. Veronica, Veronica Goldhorn and Ernie. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, President Perkins, uh, member of the board, Dr. Ely. Uh, Mrs. Goldhorn are here and I are here this evening to uh, give you a, a mid-year priority three update uh, <clears throat> regarding highly satisfied students, parents, and our community. Within, within this, uh, we've got a couple goals that, that we'll go through and, and give you a little bit more of an explanation of, of uh, how we set these goals and, and how the, what this average mean means. But... Our goal 3.1, <clears throat> which was set at the beginning of this this strategic plan, which was you know set for the 18 through 20, 22 school year, uh, the goal that was set was 60 cent, 60 cent, 66 percent of respondents will indicate satisfaction on the SCUCISD district student engagement survey, uh, which was by June 2022. Uh, this year, our academic this academic year of 21 22, our annual goal is 77 percent. Because uh, we've already surpassed uh, the 66 percent uh, goal 3.2, we set as 80 percent of respondents will indicate satisfaction on the SCUCISD uh, district parent satisfaction survey uh, by June 2022, and, the, and our goal for this academic year um, is 81 percent. Taking a look at just really what these the average mean that we look at when rating these uh, really mean. Um, looking at 1 to 1.9 being poor, uh, 2 to 2.9 uh, we would regard as fair, 3 to 3.9 we consider good, a 4 to a 4.4 very good, and then excellent would be a 4.5 to a 5. So taking a look at the, the 3.1 goal that we set at 66%, you can see that uh, our academic year of 2021 was at 75%. So, you know, we already surpassed the 66%, but to push ourselves, uh, we set a goal of 77% for this school year. And the way that we analyze these as a, as a district, and then each of our campuses do this on their own as well, but we look at the three greatest strengths, the three highest uh, scoring for us, and within our student engagement uh, results for this uh, for the 21 or the 2021 school year uh, our greatest strengths were i enjoy pe class with a mean of 4.41 my principal is a good leader uh, with a mean of 4.32 and then learning is important at my school with a mean of 4.28 and then some areas of opportunity or weaknesses that we have found in our student engagement uh, results um, and I'll remind you, these are all still in a good range, but they are uh, of the lowest for us. But at 3.05, students show respect for each other at this school. 
My teacher asked me how I learned best at 3.39. I regularly receive feedback from school staff about my academic progress at 3.39. And then the last, I like going to my school each day at 3.51. And now for our parent satisfaction results from last school year. We have, our results last year, we reached 80% uh, based on our parent survey. This year's goal is 81, as Mr. Reynolds mentioned. And now let's take a look at our opportunities and our strengths. So here are our strengths in that parent survey. My family is treated with respect at this school and the school is clean and well-maintained. There was a tie for our top uh, strength there. We also have uh, the school provides a safe environment for my child to learn. And last of all, my child felt welcomed by teachers, staff, and students in this school when our family moved into this area. And um, those are all in the very good range. So when we look at our opportunities, we have I regularly receive feedback from school staff on how well my child is learning, 3.55. I receive positive communication about my child from the school, 3.71 and I'm satisfied with the gifted and talented programs in the school district, 3.74. I wanna point out that on that last bullet, I'm satisfied with the GT talented programs. That is improving based on la uh, the 2020 results and to the 20, well actually the 2019 to 2020 results. So I anticipate that gonna be, that's gonna continue to climb with the efforts that our district is making within that particular area. Our next steps for this year's 2022 surveys is that we're gonna be opening up the uh, surveys for both parents and students on March 1st, and then the surveys will close on April 1st. We provide electronic opportunities for parents and students to participate, as well as paper versions, because we want to get as much participation as possible. And we also provide a QR code, which our district and campus post on our website and on our newsletters to make it very convenient for our parents and students to access. And then finally, in May, we receive those results, the student and parent results. We share that data with the district, with all of our campuses, and from May to July, we analyze that data by district and with our campuses. And we look to see if our DIP, our district improvement plan, and our campus improvement plan goals were met. And then we utilize what we call a listen and learn protocol. That helps us to determine our top three strengths and the top and the bottom three opportunities and then we put actions into place as a district and as campuses and we put those in our district improvement plan and in our campus improvement plan so that way we can uh, make some progress and as I shared uh, we hope to see progress in those opportunities within students and within our parents. And then last of all in the parent survey we have parent responses and they are asked three things. What's working well? What can be improved? and who to recognize. We take that information because the campuses already get it, the district, uh, district leaders get it, but we also make sure we provide it to those uh, directors and those departments so they can also learn from that and celebrate their strengths as well as their opportunities. Questions? I do. Um, back in 2021, last year, we had 3,060 parents participate in that survey. Well, we have, we have, I don't know that we have a total number of parents because we have, we know we have about 15,900 students. I just want to point out that um, given what we've had the last two years with the ups and downs of everything, I think a lot of the results there are indicative of the work that our teachers do and our staff do to maintain relationships with, this, with their students and the, the parents. I think overall, overall, a lot of our parents are very, very happy with their teachers and what their kids are doing, or at least that we're trying to do um, given everything that's going on. So I think this is just, I, I, think, I think this fits well to where we are. 
Can you go back to the uh, student survey? You want to look at the goals, the strengths, the opportunities, opportunities. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sorry about that. Errors for opportunities. So, in a very general sense, many of those to me speak the most social and emotional language. Or does that not to you? Yes, sir, it definitely does. And, and uh, one of the things Ms. Goldhorn and I did is go back and look at our, our district improvement plan and, and looking at some of the campus improvement plans. And really, a lot of the ways that as campuses that we're addressing some of these areas of opportunity is through social emotional learning and, and uh, just ways we can get kids to be connected with teachers and, and uh, you know, have, have a strong sense of belonging with, with that campus. Yeah. So, I don't know, Dr. Ely, when's our next SEL presentation? Don't we get one once a year annually? No? Maybe that was an EPAC you gave me. It was an EPAC that we got one. All right. Well, I think I'm on EPAC, so I'll get one sooner or later. <laughs> Thank you. That's all. I was just pointing out the SEL aspect of the um, – especially in light of COVID and everything else going on. So. I can just give also give you the number of you know, students that have participated. So uh, 2020, a COVID year, right, we had 3,832. Uh, this last year, and, and this we have data, or I have data in my hand all the way back from 2017, uh, we had the highest response rate of 5,871 students. Okay, Mr. Governor. Yes, sir. The one other question, um, if I may, the, the gifted and talented program, how many so how many students are actually in the gifted and talented program? I'm so sort of surprised that it made it onto the onto the list because I would imagine it's not a large percentage of parents that are students. And I th and that is truly you're looking at a small group of parents and students that are identified gifted and talented. As far as the number goes, I do not have that, but we can provide that for you next time. I think that's in the taper, is it not? Yeah. So we'll have that number here briefly. Oh, good. Perfect. I was wondering um, if there's any way that we can entice more parents to participate in the survey. Um, one way that as campuses have found is that um, we hold parent nights and they provide a station for parents to go through the computer lab as part of an opportunity. So they structure that and uh, strategically plan those. Um, but we send those paper copies home as much as we can and incentivize you know, uh, for parents to participate because we want that feedback from as many parents as we can. Were there any surprises? I, I don't think so because when we look at our data, we are pretty solid when we look at our top three and our bottom three since we started using these student and parent surveys back in 2017 as Mr. Reynolds referred to. We're pretty steady with our top three and the bottom three, but um, we, we're we always in that good range and higher, nothing below, so that's um, that's promising, right? Um, so nothing surprising, it's, but it, it's good to see the, um, the progress that we're making in those opportunities. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have cor correspondence. Correspondence. All right. Re next, we have report on board advocacy. Amy, you get to start. So, I missed a few events. Oh, there you are. Sorry, Mr. Governor. I missed a few events that I had planned to go to due to having to um, stay away for a little bit. Okay. Um, but I was able to um, attend the Simmons Road basketball game, which was really exciting. Um, I enjoyed watching that because I as well play high school basketball, so it was fun and I had to make sure I didn't yell and scream too loud. <laughs> um, I also attended um, a Clemens Project graduation fundraiser um, that hosted um, Frank Harris, um, former Clemens alumni and UTSA star quarterback. Um, I know his family personally, and so I just wanted to go out and support him and Project graduation, and I have loved through the district as a whole, seeing students who graduated come back and give back to their schools by either what Frank did or, you know, I've seen other um, students come back and teach through the athletic department that they are in. So I really, I enjoy seeing former students do that. 
And then of course we attended the conference this past weekend, all of us, which was a great weekend. I really enjoyed seeing it. Thank you. Thank you. Similar to Amy, I was quarantined at least twice. <laughs> and I was upset because there were events that I planned to attend. So we got to just keep going and I'm gonna plan as many events as I can. I haven't been to any athletics I play football, so, so <laughs> I, you know, that's, that's my favorite, but I want to see, you know, the wrestlers and, and everything, so those are my plans, God willing. How do I can grab this That seems weird, right, Dale? <laughs> You're holding something like that up to you? Yeah. Have no events for me. Thank you. Um, last Thursday, I made it to the um, Northeast Partnership Luncheon, and there was a presentation on the construction that they're going to start on I-35 from 410 to um, 1103. And that was an interesting one um, to, to, to look at what is coming in the next five years and what they will be building. And I know that um, we kind of joke, like, how can this get any worse? Well, the highway construction is coming. Thank you. I got to attend the same uh, Northeast Partnership, and it, and it was a little discerning. We're, we're going to have construction for a long time on 35. It'll be an improvement, but it'll cost us. I also got to do the communities and schools board this morning, and, and we did it. We switched to to virtual, although I didn't read it till after I got to the restaurant. <laughs> so I got to do virtual via my phone while I drove back to my house. And then this morning we had the, uh, or the, at lunch we had the chamber luncheon, and, and that was a, a good opportunity to, to get an update on the chamber and what's going on with the chamber and what's planned for the rest of the year. And uh, like everyone else, we at attended the uh, conference in, in Georgetown this weekend. That was very beneficial with, with three new board members and, and new, all of us in new positions. It was a great opportunity to get to know each other and get to know how, how we think. And that's all I have. New business. <laughs> Report this to the items and see. Report discussion items, public hearing, Texas Academic Performance Report, or CAPR, as is known, presented by Araceli Trejo. Good evening. Good evening, President Perkins, Dr. Ely, members of the board, um, and all present. Thank you for having me. My name is Araceli Trejo, and I am the District Testing and Accountability Coordinator for the district. Um, and I will be discussing the 2020 2021 um, district annual report and mainly focusing on the taper report, the Texas Academic Performance Report. The state and the Texas Education Code 39.306 requires that each district boards of trustees publish an annual report that includes the taper report within 90 calendar days of receiving the report. The report was published on December the 3rd. Let me get the clicker in here. There we go. The district annual report consists of eight sections. Um, tonight, my main focus, like I said, is gonna be the Texas Academic Performance Report, 
As you can see, the annual report also includes other sections that have been reported to you all or will be reported in the future. The Texas Academic Performance Report is compiled by TEA for every district and campus using TEAMS, the Public Education Information Management System data and also the student assessment data. There are three components to the taper. Star results or star performance, the post-secondary readiness, and staff, student, and program information. You have all been provided with a copy of the 2020-2021 Texas Academic Performance Report. The cover page of the taper report lists the district name, number, and the 2021 accountability rating and 2021 special education determination status. Given the impact of COVID-19, all districts and schools receive a not rated declared state of disaster rating for 2021 with no distinctions designations assigned. The 2021 special education determination status for 2021 is meets requirements which is the highest of the four determination levels available. The first section of the taper report that I'll be talking about this evening is star performance. And this was reported back in July of 2021 where we dove into the data for each subject, each grade level, and all the data presented at that time. As mentioned in July, there were a few changes um, for this year. Student Success Initiative, SSI, was eliminated, and the STAR Academic Growth Progress was not calculated uh, due to the absence of STAR data for 2020. However, we do want to share some items um, that we want to gather for the, from the STAR performance component. One of them being the star participation. So in 2020, as you can see, we had 90% participation out of all the students that are supposed to uh, participate on the star. And as you can see in the previous two years, we had 99% um, participation. We also want to share our highlights. Um, first, our star performance highlights. Um, despite the star performance um, dipping for everyone in the state, um, we managed to perform above the state um, performance at an average of nine percentage points um, in all performance areas, approaches, meets, and masters. The state came in at 67% at approaches, and we were at 78%. The state at the meets was at 41% and we were at 52%. And then as masters, um, the state came in at 18% and we were at 23%. Another highlight also was the English two end of course assessment. We also increased our passing rate by six percentage points over the previous tested year for the English two end of course assessment, which is administered in 10th grade. We increased from 79% in 2019 to 85% in 2021. The state also went up, however, only by three points. We also performed 14 percentage points above the state rate. This assessment, like I said, is taken around the 10th grade. We also noticed two areas of focus for SEUC uh, based on the STAR performance. First are accelerated testers. Accelerated testers are defined as students who complete an EOC, STAR EOC, at the approaches level or above in Algebra 1, English 2, and or Biology prior to entering the ninth grade. For our district, the majority of these students are students who take Algebra 1 in junior high. 
Accelerated testers are included in the accountability, accountability calculation for the accountability cycle once they're re reported as enrolled in 12th grade on PEAN's October snapshot date. This report, this group of students is required to, SA, to take the SAT or ACT before graduating from high school. Then this SAT and ACT score is converted to an approaches, meets, or master's performance level. Our accelerated students are doing well when it comes to approaches or passing. However, only 5% of them are performing at the master's level based on the SAT and ACT level scores. Um, this is nine points less than the state average. This includes students who, like I said, took Algebra 1 back in 17-18 school year when they were in junior high. Approximately 450 students, 219 at Dobie, and 231 at Corbett. The majority, 99.9%, .9 were eighth grade students. I'm sorry. Our second area of focus is our current emergent bilingual ESL or e English learner students. This group under the all grades, all subjects star performance section of the taper report, this group dropped an average of 20 percentage points from 65% in 2019 to 45% in 2021. However, the state also dropped 16 percentage points um, from 63% in 2019 um, to 47% in 2021. Overall, that was our performance for them, that group. Our next component is the taper report. In the taper report is post-secondary readiness. First, uh, we can start off with the college, career, and military readiness percentages for the class of 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020. CCMR has been calculated at the state level since 2017. And every year after that, we've increased from 52.9 61.2 to 72.7. However, the class of 2020 CCMR calculation or percentage dropped to 59.1 due to the removal of certain criteria. One, the half point CCMR credit that is awarded to our students who complete a career technology education or CTE coherent sequence of courses. The second item that was changed or eliminated for one year um, is the exclusion of military readiness for students enlisted in the military. The, the students, the state's rate, CCMR rate, also decreased, as you can see, from 72.9 to 63%. Next, we have a breakdown of our 52%, I mean 59.1% for the class of 2020 broken down by category. For college ready, we're at a 50.9%. This was for the class of 2020. Career ready, 17.9%. And military ready with no data available. The state did not issue any data for the military readiness since the military readiness has been temporarily suspended pending the identification of reliable data source, the Department of Defense. Also note that each percentage may include students who are CCMR ready in several areas. We also have provided a list of the CCMR criteria by component um, per state um, rule. Next we have SAT. Um, SAT scores from 2018, 2019, and 2020, um, along with the region and the state, the district in blue, region in light blue, and state in the yellow. The district beat the region and state average for the past three years. 
We also increased our percentage average score, I mean not percentage, excuse me, the average score of 1036 to 1044. That's a total of eight percentage points, uh, an increase of, ten, of eight percentage points. Here we have the ACT average scores for 2018, 2019, and 2020 graduates. Um, again, SCUCISD uh, beat the state and the region averages. The 2020 graduate state average score was a 20, the region a 20, and then the SCUCISD graduates raised it to 23. Next, we have our graduation rate for the class of 2020 at 97.3. This includes students who started the ninth grade in 2016, 2017 school year and completed within four years. Our four year graduation rate went up from 96.9 to now 97.3. In addition, we have a breakdown of the graduate graduation rate by graduation program plan. Program plan. <laughs> attendance. Next we have our attendance and chronic absenteeism. Our attendance for 2019-2020 um, school year increased from 9528 in 2018-2019 uh, pre-COVID to 99% in 1920 school year. Our abs and this is based on an 11% mobility rate. So you can see on the bottom, the state was, has a 13.8 mobility rate. And this includes students who have been enrolled for less than 83% of the school year or have missed six or more absences. The district reflects, the district mobility rate reflects school to school mobility as well within the same district as well as from another outside district, outside of the district. Our chronic absenteeism percentage as also did well and decreased from 9.3 to 4.2. This includes the number of K through 12 students enrolled for at least 10 days and absent for 10% or more days. The last component of the taper report is our staff, student, and program information. This data is reported to the state once throughout the year, specifically the last Friday in October. This was for the 2020. Here we have our students, our student count by program or student group with a student enrollment of 15,673 back in 2020 of October, um, a drop from 299 students from the previous year. It is important to note our large programs, our larger programs. First, we have our military connected at 37.3, and that's about almost 6,000 students. We then have 32% at risk, about 5,000 students. And you can see the difference from the prior year. Also 28.3 economically disadvantaged students, about 4,400 students. And Title I, 13.8, about 2,200 students. Those are our larger programs. And also special education, 13.1% at 2,050 students and a growth of almost 2% or more. But also uh, along those other programs, we have programs that have grown like Section 504. We've gone up from 9.1 to 9.4 with 1,473 students. GT, this was back in 2021 with 1,045 and have gone up from 5.8% to 6.7. And dyslexia has also gone up 956, almost 1,000 students from 5.1 to 6.1. And our bilingual ESL students, about 650 students, uh, my, uh, decreased a little bit there 
also. Also included in the Tabor report, and this is a large, large report as you can see um, in front of you, is also the student ethnic distribution. We have about 45% of our students are Hispanic, about 35 white, 11.2 African American, and so forth. Next we have our teacher ethnic distribution. And here we have about 22% Hispanic, about 69% white, and then the other ethnicities listed there for you. I also went ahead and um, listed for you our student, our teachers. Um, our teachers are highly qualified teachers and 99% of them hold a bachelor's degree or higher. Again, the taper report comes from that one day of year, one day of the year, October, um, where the state takes a picture of our district and Here's where we're at as far as our teachers back then, 988. Teachers by years of experience, we also have that um, for you. And we have about 81% of them that have six plus years experience um, compared to the state where the state comes in at 66%. When it comes to six plus years of experience, we also have 23 back then 23 teachers that were beginning, and we have, we had 18 teachers who had 30 or more years experience. Next, um, we have our teacher turnover rate comparison, where we clearly fell below the state. Our goal is always to fall below the state average. Our rate continues to decrease annu annually. This year we dropped from 9.7 to 8.8. .8 and this includes promotions and retirees. In addition, we've listed the teacher turnover rate by the regional comparison. Um, here we have the lowest turnover rate where we do have the lowest turnover rate in the surrounding area and districts. We take pride in having the lowest turnover rate, teacher turnover rate among the surrounding districts. SEUC, rate is 8.8 .8. slightly below above is north side isd at 9.9 9.1 then northeast isd with 11.6 new braunfels with 12.6 judson at 13.5 comal isd 16 percent and last east central at 21 0.5%. This completes the taper report presentation on its components. Um, each year, TA prepares and publishes a taper uh, glossary and guidelines also for um, districts and for the public where the definitions are um, listed, described, mythologies are also included, and a list of resources for each data point of the taper report. A Spanish version is also available. And I would like to close um, by saying that all of this complete, this complete report will be posted on the district website and the campus website. Um, and I will now open it up for any questions or comments. questions I, I just wanted to comment that um, what kind of jumped out at me as I was looking at this earlier today that across the board um, given where we are we still perform for the most part in almost in every category above the state average or and above the region average so which was really good and a couple of other things that kind of jumped out at me that I kind of keep track about are our AP and um, college uh, performance. I, I noticed that even during this time of COVID, we did have some pretty good jumps in the number of kids who do get college credit, which, which to me was really uh, a, a huge plus for us, given uh, what has gone on in the last year. And also with our um, uh, on-ramps programs, 
um, that was a huge like bonus for us. I mean, like huge, like like wow, we did significantly better than the state average and the region average. And that, uh, I, I do know from experience from my kids having tried that, the on-ramps program, I mean, that is hard. Mm -hmm. And so for our kids, for us to get that number that are succeeding and getting college credit, I think that that is a huge kudos to the teachers and their dedication to the programming, as well as the support staff that's helping them get that going and the students uh, sticking with that program as well. So thank you. Mr. President, <coughs> excuse me, Mr. President, just remind me this is a public hearing. <coughs> Any other questions? <coughs> the the taper is reported for the not the prior year, but one year behind. All our data is one year behind. Yes, sir. It was a good report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thanks for running us through all those numbers. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mr. President, um, I think that we need to get opportunity to realize that our district is doing something correctly. So. In the next four to five months, when we're undergoing a strategic plan, right, we're going to be looking at, you know, the end, looking backwards, but it's also important to look at what we've done is good in the past and make sure we'll continue to do that one. So, for example, the teacher turnover rate is, has been always lower than our cohorts for, this is, well, this is last, this is three years worth of trending data, but it's pretty much as long as I've been on the board. So, uh, I would imagine that part of that is the culture. We want to maintain the culture. And so we got to look past and we got to sort of look towards the future at the same time. So thank you very much. I think it was a good report. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Yes, sir. This uh, is a public hearing, so we can open it up to public comments if there are any. Seeing none, thank you very much. Now we're on to public hearing. Number two, district elementary and secondary school elementary relief, ESSER plan review. Wayne Pussman. Good evening, President Perkins, Dr. Ely, members of the board. So tonight, as we've done uh, this past summer, we had our first public hearing regarding uh, the ESSER funds, regarding ESSER 2, ESSER 3, and the supplement funding source. Uh, per the regulations on ESSER dollars, we also must have a public meeting with public comment uh, regarding this every six months. And in the big overall picture of this is when we first initiated this this past summer, we also put a survey out on the website to obtain some feedback and that is part of the requirement as well. So tonight we'll talk a little bit about what the survey provided us and moving forward uh, the plan that the district has at this time. Uh, another reminder is that this plan is living. It's multi-year. It's what we feel at the time as we're doing budget planning, budget prep, but also making adjustments throughout the year and as being as um, flexible and nimble as we can. So without further ado, so per board policy, CB local uh, state revenue sources require public meeting and public comments, as I mentioned just a while ago, for the federal grants. Uh, here's the big overview. So ESSER 2, the main fo you see the allocation there, a little over $3.3 million. The main focus of ESSER, th ESSER 2 was for the safety of school students and the impact of coronavirus on students. Uh, ESSER 2 dollars are to be expensed by 2023. Uh, it's or three off to the right there. You'll see the allocation came in 2021, a little over $7.5 million. The main focus of ESSER three was to address district needs, including learning loss. At least 20% of the funds must go towards learning loss due to coronavirus. Uh, expense this one by 2024. And then came the supplemental, ESSER supplemental grant. 
this allocation again in 2021, uh, 3.7, a little over $3.7 million you see there. The main focus of the supplemental was to provide additional resources to pay for unreimbursed costs due to the coronavirus. While all these funding mechanisms were coming forth, there, what the supplemental came from was a survey that came between the, the two and the three on district needs. And these allotments, some districts got huge amounts of money and some didn't. So this was kind of a, a catch up allocation on the supplemental side. So overall, a little over 11 point, mm, we'll call it six uh, million dollars there. So um, going through then, so some additional information on ESSER two. So this came from the CARISA Act of 2021, and a share of ESSER two was used by the state to plug in uh, some lost FSP funding. If you recall back in the news, there was the supplement, supplant, uh, well, the state took a share of that ESSER II funds, and we received uh, the balance. Any leftover funds um, uh, from ESSER II will follow for ESSER III, the guidance for use for student needs. Here, I'm going to pause here, too, that on ESSER II and three, and on supplemental, there's a caveat that the district, if they meet the other requirements, you can use these dollars for any other operational cost of the district. So it's kind of wide open at the end. It's a little asterisk in the fine print. So focusing on there. So the ESSER II spending plan, uh, dollars set aside for lesson creation. Uh, if you recall, the employee retention incentives, the, the payments that we did uh, back in the, the past year. And then also uh, when House Bill 4545 was uh, finalized, the tutoring cost of that. A lot of this, um, went to 6,100 costs, our payroll costs, uh, as you can see there. Lesson creation, that's the extra time the teacher spent off, and uh, we provided funding for that um, in the same, the same way for doing for our, um, now I'm losing it, our online Schoology um, program. So that is in place there, filling in. So for ESSER three, this came from the American Rescue Plan, uh, this one has that caveat of at least 20% of the funds are to be used to address learning loss through evidence-based interventions that respond to students' academic, social, and emotional needs. Uh, it's kind of open to, to, to interpretation there as well, uh, but we are following that. Required feedback from various district stakeholder groups. This is the public hearing format of that uh, regarding those funds. And there's the, in the last bullet you see the six-month updates uh, to the district for the safe return in person instruction and continuity of services um, for that. So uh, ESSER three, su uh, summer learning. We expanded our summer learning this past year, plan to do keep the same format in there as well. So we have some summer learning dollars in there for the, sum for the plan. Social, emotional and mental health needs uh, through our com uh, communities and schools as well as some uh, coordinate, not coordinators, but additional staff to help that on campuses. Extended learning, virtual learning. While we did this at the time, we, if you recall, when we were talking about virtual learning, we didn't really know, so it's a plan. As I said, it's fluid and it's uh, flexible. So we didn't know how big virtual learning was gonna be. So we set some, we set some dollars in there as well. And then the community, community engagement. Um, this is the part here that with the survey and trying to do more with the community, communication, uh, family nights, nights after or, or weekends, those type of things for the campuses. So funds for, for those campuses so they don't have to expend their 199 budgets onto that. Uh, moving forward then, the third and final on the ESSER supplemental. Uh, these are the federal funds distributed by TEA. These came through the state uh, to cover those expenses not covered by other ESSER grants. And uh, focus is to address learning loss um, with the intensive educational supports for students not performing satisfactorily. Uh, parts of this spending plan were the employee retention incentives, again, uh, accelerated learning uh, programs for that, as well as, again, you'll see their family engagement. So focusing on the employees, the students, and the families, uh, you can see a little uh, trend on the, on the there. So when we presented the plan, we launched the survey over the summer and up until 
this past week, so we stopped, received the survey responses um, for fall. These are the highest three indicators uh, for as regarding as priority for the respondent. Before we get into that, uh, I want to go over the data for the survey. On the respondents, we had 81 responses. Of those, almost 60% were SCUC staff, 25% were students. Parents made up 8%, and then uh, board 2.4, and community 2.4. So we're going to try to get this out there again, get some more uh, activity in there. Miss Jackson has already volunteered to assist. Where is she? There you are. I don't even know where you are anymore. OK, sorry. So to, to get this out there more, to get more feedback regarding this. So you can see here the respondents from our uh, survey, the first round, uh, mental health concerns at 95%, learning loss at 85, and then professional development at 84 uh, for the survey data that we received. So moving forward um, in a high level view on our spending proposal for the ESSER funds, taking our summer learning costs and expanding them across the board all the way through 2024. So making sure we have that uh, accounted for. Uh, having money in the plan for extended day, extended week learning, that could be however the campus or the district uh, so desires. Also social, emotional, mental health needs uh, virtual learning is, now that we've seen the numbers, is not so much, but we'll still carry that in there. Family engagement, lesson creation, PD, and then any other activities um, to maintain the operations of the district, as I mentioned, the asterisk at the end. Again, final caveat, plan can be modified and changed as needed. We make amendments, uh, addendums to this uh, through, the, through the portal, through TEA, on as, as we go through the year, as we're doing budget planning, and then after budget adoption, we've, we've also made some, some flexibility plan or changes in there to show some flexibility. Uh, so just as uh, some, you may have some internal questions of, okay, there's, there's some information in there, but what do we really have there? So for, for instance, I mentioned on ESSER 3, the, on the mental health, 150,000, as well as to address some uh, dyslexia, you saw on the taper just a while ago, dyslexia numbers go going up as well. To, to help out on special ed, we have some LSSP uh, positions in there that we've funded as well for over 225,000. Summer learning, we're setting aside about a half a million. Uh, we learned as we closed up the books, summer learning actually cost about a million. We, we are anticipating receiving about 248, 250,000 for our reimbursement for ADSY, the additional day school year for the youngsters. So a net of about 750. So we need to adjust that as, as we look forward to moving, moving forward. Again, the flexibility on there. Communities and schools on our contracted services side, we're looking at over 550,000 uh, for 21-22. Uh, and then with the, the cost of the percentage moving up uh, to 591, 591,000 in the next year. And these are just a few examples on here. Also, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say this because I want to I want to own this one. On the supply side, we didn't know what COVID was going to do. So we stuck some money in the COVID budget on this plan. We're now seeing what we're what we don't. I mean, if you remember back, it was masks and gloves and sanitizer and all this. So we set some money into there. So we have some supply budgets in there that or about half a million for next year. We're going to relook at that too and see where those funds can be allocated again um, and, and, and move from there. So how does this whole process work? You heard me talk about budget development part, but also uh, through leadership um, meetings and discussions, you know, things that are popping up, things that happen, they're in there for the discussion. This, this, they're going to need money for this. Is it 199 or is it ESSER? We did part of that today. I threw that out there too. You know, some of this could be uh, ESSER related on the topic that we were discussing. This is an ongoing, this isn't a one and done. We don't put a close the book. It's pretty much weekly in this hallway, if I can say that. Um, so with that, I'll stop talking and take any questions or if we want to open it up for the public hearing for your discussion.
was wondering um, when the ESSA funds run out, we're going to be accustomed to buying things and seeing things and utilizing more, you know, <coughs> employing more educators and all that. Are we, do we have plans for that? Yes, ma'am. Um, we, going into this, there was what we referred to and has been said across many districts and across the state of the cliff at the end of this. You know, don't get accustomed to here's all this, call it stuff, for lack of a more professional term, but you're doing all these things and programs, and then at the end of it, in 24, 23 and 24, there's no more. What are you going to do? You're going to have to absorb that. We're trying to be very careful in what we're doing and monitoring. If we bring in staff to LSSPs or the dyslexia staff, we look and we're going to look and see, the plan is to look and see throughout the course of this, is there an opportunity to move that from ESSA to 199 and be as strategic and as smart as we can with this plan as we move forward. Thanks. I just have a real quick specific question. Those COVID tests that we're using, those are coming from the state, right? We're not having to pay for those, correct? Correct. Dr. Edwards. Currently, that is correct. Um, with uh, an inability to give us a de definite date of when our next shipment uh, will arrive, we are looking at all uh, possibilities. Uh, and so what we're researching now, are there, are there organizations or companies out there that could go ahead and provide us kits that may not be a part of the state funding on that and that we would pick up the cost on it? from the public all right we, we don't have any thank you Mr. Wayne thank you very much thank you next we have report teacher incentive allotment update presented by Kelly Kovacs and Linda Cannon Yes, good evening, President Perkins, Dr. Ely, and members of the board. We are going to share an update on where we are with our teacher incentive allotments. Um, we'll do this periodically throughout the uh, rest of the semester to kind of keep you updated on where we are. We do have a member of our committee here tonight, and I'd like to introduce her. Her name is Amy Zimmerman. She is one of our teachers at Watts Elementary, and she currently works with our dyslexia students there. We wanted to bring her here today because she has been involved with our committee throughout the process this year and has some information to share with you as well later on in the presentation. So just as a reminder, the uh, teacher incentive allotment was designed to ensure we have teachers in the classroom that have access to those six bill year salaries. Um, however, it is uh, prioritized at funding for high needs campuses um, and those that are in rural districts and campuses. So um, <clears throat> each district and each campus will uh, generate a different amount based on the level of designation that a teacher should receive. So there's two ways to earn that teacher incentive allotment designation. One of those is national board certification. So that's already in process. And if we were to have any teachers that are here that have national board certification or any that move in, they can already generate the money for teacher incentive allotment. So that's already in place, and we are actually um, working um, together with our coordinators to see if we can develop a cohort of teachers who are interested in earning that designation. It's a pretty lengthy process. It takes about two years, but so we would like to help those that might be interested in earning that designation because then they can generate that money for teachers and allotment automatically should they get that designation. There are 25 certificate areas and 16 disciplines in which a teacher can earn a designation. Um, the second way is that we develop our own local designation system, and we've talked to, to you periodically about this. Um, we have formed a committee. The committee's been working all year. Um, we meet at least once a month to talk about the teacher incentive allotment, and we ask for a lot of feedback from that committee. So we have primarily 24 teachers on that committee. We have four principals, 
And then there are six directors, assistant directors, and coordinators that are helping assist the process. And like I said, we really we have met at least once a month to, to um, task them with giving us feedback on where they should would think we should go with the teacher instead of allotment. So we're going to talk a little bit about where we are today. <clears throat> so there's lots of factors and key decisions that we have to make. Um, for instance, in the teacher observation expectations, how many um, should they be over 45 minutes? Should they be um, should they be walkthroughs, and how long should those walkthroughs be? Um, we have to look at those as student growth measurement tools. What do we have in place? What do we need to have in place? And then how will those count towards um, our the student growth expectations for uh, the teacher instead of allotment? Additional factors, do we want to include parent surveys, student surveys, leadership opportunities that these teachers are taking? And then also the system weights, how much should student growth count versus teacher observations? And then how are we going to distribute the money? Uh, should it go to um, directly to the teacher? Should it go to others that help support the teacher? So there's lots of questions that would need to be answered as we move through this process. So t um, with the committee, we, we had a group of them. We split them up and said, all right, this group's working on teacher observation expectations. And we um, asked them a lot of questions about things. And so one thing we learned early on is that we need to calibrate. Our administrators, whether it be within their own campus or whether it be between campuses, we need to make sure that our administrators are calibrated when it comes to scoring the teacher rubric in um, our t-test evaluations. And so we partnered with ESC 20 and we have nine sessions of calibration um, that we're working through this year and all of it really ties just right back to calibration and our, how are we seeing those scores um, across the district. And then we know that that work will continue beyond 2021, um, 2022. We know that that's something that we will have to do quarterly as new administrators come into our buildings and also just to making sure that we are still scoring these equitably across our district. So we passed our, our committee and we said, well, all right, how many observations should we require for TIA for it to be um, scored fairly in this, in this area? How many minutes for each evaluation? Should we have a second evaluator for each teacher eligible for TIA? And how will this impact teachers and administrators? Um, and then what scores will teachers have to attain to be considered for TIA? So we got the group and we, we kind of put them to work and that committee came back with recommendations and they said, we feel like for, for a teacher to be eligible for TIA, we either need to, on option one, have one 45 minute observation and for 20 minute walkthroughs, which is lengthier than what we currently um, request. Um, and two of those could be completed by a second evaluator. Or option two would be two 45 minute observations and one of those could be recorded by the teacher and sent to a second evaluator for scoring and then two 20 minute walkthroughs. They really felt like they should see a complete full cycle to be able to count this towards TIA. Um, there is a recommendation from TEA on the teacher observations on the minimum average ratings. And that group said, we, we think that's best. And so we actually, they recommended that we stick with what TEA has, has recommended on the, the average ratings for those observations. So as we worked through this, some items that, we, that came to, to light really quick was, you know, if we add um, teacher observations to the pro plate of the administrators or additional walkthroughs, what impact is that going to have on our current administrators? Um, they actually also talked about, the group talked about how now observations and walkthroughs are becoming high stakes. Um, it's going to be a little bit more challenging um, and competitive with our teachers. And then how we, you know, if we decide to record, we, do we have the ability to do that right away or should, is that going to be something we need to purchase equipment or look at the best way options to be able to record? So these are some of the things that really came out of that group to say, you know, this is a concern. We've got we've to answer all these questions, but we want to make it fair and equitable, but how are we going to make sure that we also don't overtask our administrators and make it a competitive world for, for our teachers? Okay, I'll turn it over to Kelly. Okay. Actually, is Amy going to present? <laughs> as far as student growth measures go, um, we as a committee looked at the different options that the state offers as far as growth measurement tools that we can use. We know that one size won't fit all for all subject areas and all grade levels. Um, so a couple that we looked at, we spent some time watching some videos, looking at some different scenarios to figure out what would be best for different teaching assignments across the district. 
Um, the first one that we looked at were value-added measures. These are the most valid and reliable measures um, in order to determine student growth. They can be used with any nationally normed or criterion reference test. Um, some examples of what we currently have in our district are NWEA MAP growth, um, we have the STAR test, and um, we also have TechPIA and CIRCLE, which is what we use with our pre-K and kindergarten students. Um, we also have student learning objectives, um, which would be a multi-step process that would use beginning of the year assessment data and would create growth plans for each student. Um, this would be something where it would require some additional work where we would have to develop those plans for each student and then we would have to analyze their growth at the end of the year to see if they've met the expect expected growth. Um, we could also look at pre-tests and post-tests. Uh, these are best done with third-party assessments, so things like our NWEA, um, but it could also be built through the district. Um, if we do that, we would have to develop those at the district level um, and vet them, and so it would be a lengthy process. Um, it would take some staffing and um, additional time to build those. Um, and then we also have portfolios, and this is where we would align the expectations to standards and create a rubric um, they're most helpful for um, performance-based subject areas like art or band where we might not have an, a third-party assessment that could come in and look at the student growth. Um, some of the things that our committee considered were what valid and reliable measurement tools do we currently have in place across the district, and based on that information, what content areas could we just hit the ground running and, and start moving forward. Um, but then we also know that we would need to probably develop and vet some other um, tools. So what would we need to do in order to, to meet that? And then also, what percentage of students meeting growth would need to be reached in order for a teacher to be eligible for TIA? So our current recommendations um, are that we, we know that we have NWA map, we have STAR data, we have TechPIA and CIRCLE um, that we could use where possible, um, but we also know that we would probably need to develop some pre-tests and some post-tests for student learning objectives for other areas where we don't have those, those other options in place. Um, since these assessments are not in place and we would need multiple years of data to help develop the validity and the reliability, we wouldn't be able to submit the TIA plans for these areas where that assessment is not already in place. Um, so some things that we considered is the time that it's going to take to develop these measurements and then um, the possibility of staggered implementation of TIA. Uh, our current committee recommendations as far as um, what we would expect for the percentage of students meeting or exceeding their growth measure um, in order for a teacher to receive that recognized designation, 55% of students would need to meet or exceed the growth measure. In order to get that exemplary designation, we would need 60% to meet or exceed. And then for master uh, teacher, they would need 70% to meet or exceed their growth measure. Um, and just like with the, the T-test and um, those observations, we talked about the high stakes nature of these assessments and knowing what would be riding on the student growth. Um, we also discussed teacher morale, as well as just knowing that we need to correlate the expectation of student growth needs to match how student or how teachers are performing on t-tests. Otherwise, there's going to be a skew in data if they're performing higher in one area than in the other. All right, we also um, know that we can add some additional factors. As Linda mentioned, um, we can include um, survey data or teacher attendance or leadership position. Uh, it's not required, but we can do that. So some factors that um, we talked about as a committee, um, questions that we wanted them to help us answer is uh, what additional factors contribute to a teacher's impact in the classroom, since that's really the in, uh, emphasis of TIA. How might uh, adding factors such as attendance requirements impact certain teacher groups? For example, if you're out for FMLA or if you have a younger teacher with younger children who's out because their um, own children might be ill, 
should that impact? So we had a lo lot of conversation about that. And then how do we select valid and reliable sources of information for additional factors? For example, student surveys um, may be skewed. Um, how do, so there was a lot of conversation about things like that as well, as you can imagine. Um, there aren't any recommendations currently in place for this at this time, but the committee has asked for feedback on the most recent survey, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, about everything from parent surveys to student surveys, additional responsibilities, and even teacher attendance. And again, um, some things we're thinking about with that group, staff morale, the validity and reliability of the data, and how um, that those additional re responsibilities actually impact student success. The last two pieces, um, as Linda mentioned, are the system weights and the fund distribution. Um, if you have these two big pieces of the teacher evaluation and the student growth, those could be 50-50 equal, or you could say one is more important to us than the other, and so we want um, that to have different weight in our system. Um, and then the fund distribution, remember 90% goes to the campus where the teacher earned that money. Um, it can all go to the teacher who earned it, or it can be distributed. We have uh, a lot of questions to talk about with this as well. We have started the discussion. Um, some of these questions include how might those weights impact the overall score? What do we want to emphasize? Since funds count towards teacher retirement system, how might less than 90% going to the designated teacher impact teachers moving to the district? And what is the potential impact on retention based on the district's allotment funding amount compared to other districts? Um, we have not uh, made any final recommendations. The committee really needed more time with this, so we'll be talking about it again at a January and February meeting. We have asked for feedback from our staff uh, district-wide. We've sent a couple of surveys so far. We sent one in the spring where we had 247 responses, and the one that was just completed, we had 462 responses. We have ab about a little over 900 um, teachers who we were asking for feedback on. So decent response rate uh, overall. We did offer eight uh, Q&A Zoom virtual sessions, uh, both in December and in January. Nobody came, so <laughs> I don't know what that's telling us. Maybe they're not as interested in it, or uh, maybe they just were busy. But um, on January 3rd, we had a staff development day, and our committee members at all campuses had a face-to-face had -face or virtual session with their teachers to make sure they understood where we were in the system and what um, we were asking for feedback on from them. Um, that winter survey information is going to be studied by our committee at the January 28th meeting, and it may impact um, some of the recommendations that you saw tonight. In addition, the committee asked us to reach out to some other districts who are already in the process of TIA. They had several questions that they wanted us to kind of track down. Um, reaching out to them, I think, uh, has probably been one of the most valuable things that our steering committee has done. Um, one of the things that uh, we mentioned earlier tonight is that um, we really don't want to submit student growth data if that growth measurement has not been in place for at least a year. Several districts cautioned us, don't do that. You're not going to pass anyway. It's a lot of work, and um, you want to make sure that you pass uh, that Texas Tech data validation. So um, that is a good, good information for our committee to know. They also talked about, uh, all of them talked about some unintended consequences that they did not anticipate. Um, Amy mentioned that correlation between t-tests and student growth. So if a teacher scores high on t-tests, but not on student growth or vice versa, it creates a skew in the data. That means if we have too many of those, nobody qualifies for teacher incentive allotment. And it's set up a little bit of a, a friction in some districts when those two things aren't happening and nobody qualifies for TIA because the data is not um, showing up as valid. And then uh, morale concerns, uh, particularly during COVID, but in general, um, that this is a new expectation. There's some additional assessments that students are being given. There's an increase in time to complete TIA requirements. And of course, we've talked a little bit about that competitive nature of TIA. So those are all things that we'll be bringing back to the committee in January for them to kind of wrestle with and talk about what our next steps are. And uh, speaking of that, uh, here's our work timeline. We shared this with you back in uh, December as well. Um, but we'll be going over the survey. We've also drafted some options for the committee to consider uh, based on the survey results just to sort of um, consolidate their time and try to ma maximize our time with them. And we'll be talking again, again about those component weights and allotments. 
Um, team one also meets, that's our principals and um, directors on up this month, and so we'll be sharing this information with them as well. And uh, with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you all might have. For sure, this is going to create competition, and those forces are stronger than we realize. So, if I missed any remarks, what came to my mind is there a way that the money could be used as a tool for teachers in a grouping of some sort, so that they essentially um, that the group wins the award, and they can use the money how they see fit amongst them. Or does this have to go to some individual who's gotten a gold star while other people didn't? Right. So the award is by individual teacher based on their PTES and their mm -hmm. growth. The money distribution is something that we can talk about. Like as, as a district, part of our TIA um, plan has to include of that 90%, it goes to the campus. And we can distribute that in a number of ways. It could go to everyone on the <coughs> campus. Um, however, um, we heard from some other districts that teachers are now starting to shop around for where they can get the most of that 90% personally because it counts towards PRS. So it, it's something, um, you know, people are thinking about themselves sometimes when they're thinking about um, that money distribution. So it is something that we can talk about uh, of the distribution of that 90% um, and we'll have to as part of our plan. I think that's the way that it's written in House Bill 3, so I don't believe so. It, the other side of that, of course, remember it goes with the teacher, so if the teacher were here and went to another district, it goes with the one teacher. So if I left the district or you know went somewhere else or retired, then that money would no longer go to the campus. So it, it is still kind of based on the teacher, individual teacher. Right. I will tell you, the committee has wrestled with this from the beginning of um, that concern, what you're talking about now. The, the teachers are very concerned about that as well and have expressed that. So we are, we are still talking about that. And uh, in, the, in the draft that they're going to be reviewing in January, there's one draft that says, let's just do the National Board Certification because anybody can get that and it eliminate some of those pieces so they'll have that option to discuss that uh, as something that they can consider or it could be a number of other um, if there's anything else that we want to prioritize then certainly we could do more than that but the national board is already in place um, and that's an option as well We will certainly uh, be listening to our teachers who are out there in the field uh, with this one. What, I have a question. Sorry. What Let's districts? Go. What do districts do if they would not have any teachers that met the uh, met the standard? Well, they just don't get the funding if they don't meet the standard. Most of the time, the issue is not that no one meets the standard; it's that their data is not considered valid and reliable and so the whole no one in the district then gets it so either nobody gets it because the district was or the the data wasn't valid and reliable or <coughs> some teachers uh, typically do meet the standard what does that do to morale yeah that's that's what we are sharing tonight yeah, is yeah. it's it becomes a very competitive um, mindset is what we're hearing from some districts I will say there was one district that we met 
to it uh, that Sh uh, Shane and Burns uh, called and talked to smaller, just they're roughly our size, but a little bit smaller. Um, they were super positive. They said, wow, this is amazing. Our teachers love it. Now they are rural and high poverty, so they're getting more. But um, they were, maybe they're not rural, but they were high poverty. Um, so their, their, their district was very positive about it, but several of the others that we talked to were concerned about that. I know you sent it out to 900 teachers and 462, 67 responded. Mm -hmm. I think that's an indication of how many teachers would actually show interest. I know nobody showed up for the virtual, but. Good question. One of the, we asked a lot of questions such as how interested would you be in national board certification if we were, you know, are you interested in that? And I believe 63 said, yes, I would be interested in national board certification if that was available. Most of the teachers in the survey were, wanted us to move forward, um, but they might not have been privy to all of the information that the committee has been, and so that's part of why we had them go out campus to campus in, on that January 3rd survey to talk about all of the things that the committee has learned, the deep learning that the committee has had um, to try to share some of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Perkins. Um, so looking at uh, student growth, we have student learner outcomes, we've got uh, portfolios. If we develop portfolios, we'd help develop uh, rubrics around those portfolios. But I really want to talk about the concept of pretest and post-test. Those seem to work well uh, for those that are not reading math uh, in the uh, K through eight and high school level and things like that. But it seems to me that if we're the, to develop those pre and post tests, we have to go, we have to develop, we have to do content validity, we have to do reliability studies. And then would we not have to treat those in the same way as we would a star test that we have them under lock and key? I'm, I'm kind of rewinding to the institution of quarterly progress assessments a few yeah. years back and holding on to those as the committee had some thoughts about or conversation about that. We have, Serena really led uh, a lot of that work so I'll let her jump in if she'd like but um, we, we would have to do all of the things that we do for a star um, like test security as you mentioned, um, training to make sure that everyone's giving them in the exact same way on the same days. Um, you have to, you know, okay all of third grade is taking this assessment pretest on this day um, so it would look a lot like a uh, state mandated test but it would be internal o oaths internal of confidentiality uh, we'd have to continue to re make those tests every year yeah um, we would have to continue to make those tests every single year um, but that's also the same for our map assessment as well so that would also become just like a star assessment we would have to make sure teachers are provided with training. There would be have to be some assurance that there's some validity and reliability to our assessment um, as we gave the MAP assessment. So we would have to make sure that kindergarten students are all taking it during the same time, first grade students and so forth. So that's for any assessment, not just for the pre and post assessment. So now we would have this whole other layer of assessment on top of STAR. The students are already taking some of those assessments uh, if you consider the MAP assessment. Um, but if we did additional pre and post tests for other content areas, that would be additional tests that our students would be taking. Yeah. We've learned a lot in the last six months, I'll just say, uh, and I just wanted to thank the committee. They've really given a lot of time and effort to um, making sure that this is a system that, that works for us and um, has a lot of voices in it, and we appreciate them. And I just wanted to thank Amy for coming out on her night off to chat with you guys. Um, if you have any other questions, we'd be happy to answer them, but just wanted to say that before we were done. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Next, we have discussion chapter 21 and non chapter 21 personnel contracts presented by Linda Cannon. Yes, good evening again. Um, just want to, as a discussion item only, 
um, let you know that we will be starting our spring um, session of contract recommendations to the board. In February, we bring our administrator contracts to the board. We, we really chunk it in three sections because there's a lot that come forward. Um, our administrator contracts are your principals, your directors, assistant directors, and then all the supervisors that could be in the ops world or in the instructional world. Um, that'll be in February. And then in March, we will bring term contracts. And these are contracts that are primarily for teachers who have been employed with us for um, more than three years um, or on their, thir their fourth year with us. Um, they move from a probationary contract to a term contract. So um, these will be teachers that have uh, typically um, have years of experience. Um, and there'll be some other staff as well. And then in April, we will bring to you probationary contracts. And these are typically our teachers who are um, newer to us. Um, they could be brand new teachers or they could be experienced teachers coming out of another district. Or it could be even staff members that have been given a promotion and they're moving from a teacher contract to an admin contract and we give them one year probation. So um, those will be the three that we three months of contracts um, that we will be discussing. Um, and um, some of these are not our chapter 21 contracts and some are non chapter 21. And the difference with the two is that chapter 21 contracts are for staff that have certification through the State Board of Education certifications through SBEC. Um, typically, um, you know, they, it's mostly teachers or it's administrators that have that SBEC certification. And then the non-Chapter um, 21 are for mostly you folks that um, don't have that certification or are working in the operations side of the house. And so there's just different uh, appeal rights that they have to those. Not chap uh, chapter 21 folks have a lot of appeal rights with their contracts if we were to renew or non-renew or terminate that contract. So so just as I just want to discuss with you tonight that those are going to be brought forward in the next three months and we'll be asking for recommendations for you to approve those contracts. Any discussion? Thank you, Linda. Next we have discussion procurement of goods and services presented by Jesse Luna. Looks like we have several items. I'll let you lead the items. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, President Perkins, Dr. Ely, members of the board and guests. Uh, tonight we do have uh, four proposals that we're bringing forth for discussion to you. The first one is a request for competitive seal proposals for athletic improvements. Uh, this project addresses the needs uh, at the baseball and soft for the baseball and softball project at Clemens High School and Byron Seal High School. This project will add a pavilion type covers to the baseball and softball batting cages at both campuses. The work will also improve seating capacity and visibility for the Clemens Baseball Stadium. Uh, this is part of the approved board savings utilization strategy. Um, where this proposal actually will hit the street tomorrow. We plan to bring it back to you in February for, for award. Currently we're estimating this at $1,540,000 and Okay, uh, the next one is a solicitation, another request for competitive, competitive seal proposals for classroom improvements. This project will provide an ADA classroom and two classrooms at Pasco Elementary and two classrooms at Jordan Intermediate. These modifications will provide improved facilities for our special needs students at these campuses. This project also includes painting of the complete campus at Pasco Elementary and Green Valley Elementary. This proposal will be going out on the street February 1st and become and will come back to you in March for approval. Currently we have an estimated cost of one million two hundred and ten thousand. Okay, the third one is uh, another request for competitive seal proposals for security vestibules. This project will uh, will improve the vestibules currently at Byron Steel High School, Allison Steel High School. Dobie Junior High and the Malish Administration Building. The modifications will provide a barrier between visitors and staff in, or in order to further improve security. This proposal will go out on February 3rd and come back in March. Currently, we're estimating this at 770,000. And I got to tell you, I had to make conscious effort not to say security vegetables. That was, <laughs> I don't know why.
Okay, last one is a request for proposals for security cameras. The purpose of this solicitation is to procure interior and exterior security cameras and camera installation services at Schertz Elementary School, Wiederstein Elementary School, the Malish Administration Building, and DAP. These cameras are replacing existing cameras already there uh, that have reached end of life or have had some sort of issues, and we'll also be purchasing some additional cameras to have on hand in case um, some of those go out. We'll have backups that technology can install rapidly. This project will uh, come to you in February for approval, and we're estimating this at 220000 currently. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Next we have discussion results of the good governance survey. <coughs> I'll be your presenter. <coughs> Can't figure that one out. you're skimming that and I'll remind everyone that part of the good governance is a self check survey that we do and we did it in December on December 10th <coughs> as you'll see looking through it it's it's a weird time to do it some brand new board members that may not be fully aware of what how we do what we're doing and <coughs> you you guys can't see it but somebody answered dead last on all of them and, and we speculate that it may have, they may have misread the, que the uh, categories. At least I hope that's the case. I thought it could have been me till the last question because I missed it. have any feedback <coughs> again it's it's kind of a placeholder will will have a, bit, a much more accurate reading when we take the next one <coughs> but I it, it's really not different than what I expected for three new board members on and and it's virtually the difference between strongly agree and agree do think we need to work on <coughs> or build a plan is the question on <coughs> if the board has a plan to uh, <coughs> I'm reading 10 here question 10 the board has a plan in place to actively strengthen community partnerships to improve overall performance and stewardship of public resources criteria for consideration the board has a plan Active plan for generation support for the district and its vision and goals with stakeholders, businesses, and other organizations. <coughs> we do make an effort to be visible and and be out there, but I don't know that we make an effort to consciously generate our district vision and goals with the stakeholders or to improve the overall performance and stewardship of funds. And there is some opportunity there uh, interacting with city government to uh, make sure we're aware of when our competition is going in when there's I mean it, it's 
it's not the school board's place to be involved with where businesses go and where homes go but there's a lot of business that goes in the Kamau side of Shirts. and uh, maybe we can can have some conversations with our city council members and make sure they're aware of that. But that's just one example. And I've talked enough. Anybody else got anything to say? All right, we've reviewed it. Next we have the discussion, board consideration and consensus on discussion items eligible for action under consent agenda. Does anybody have anything that they, that we saw tonight that they want specifically separate? <coughs> Mr. President, it looks like Chapter 21 and non-Chapter 21 contracts, that's an not applicable, we're not bringing that back. Okay. So we've got athletic improvements uh, and security cameras, correct, coming back, projected to come back in February. And we've got, um, let's see, classroom renovations and security vestibules coming back in March. Um, from an administrative point of view, I think it'd be good for all of these to be uh, an open and talk about it and not on um, no, consent, no. but we'd love for y'all to Tell us otherwise if you think we're good on putting on consent. Any thoughts? Mr. Mr. Dan, you can you can uh, hand out, or do you want? I, I would just say one more. You know, that with with where we are with commodities prices and uh, labor prices, that, that it will be interesting to see where some of these end up turning up. And make sure that this is considered. Vegetable one more time. <laughs> <laughs> then let's uh, let's keep those two separate for next month. Okay, so athletic improvements and security <coughs> cameras next month would be on the regular agenda, regular action items. Thank you, sir. Next we have action items consent of agenda items on consent. Yeah, it does. Does anybody use it? Say my name. Sorry, what you see before you are for um, consent items, approval of minutes, approval of financial statements, except the superintendent's report on budgeted purposes, purchases uh, of in excess of $50,000 and the approval of solicitation of network access control services, RFP number 22-006, V is in Victor, uh, administration moves approval, or uh, recommends approval, we don't move, we recommend. So. I move the Board of Trustees approve the consent agenda items A through D as presented. I second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Sorry about that. I had to throw you a curve just to make sure you were all listening to me. <laughs> Next, we have other action items. for board of yeah, request for board of action PASBE policy manual update 118 affecting legal and local policy and policy BE local board meetings agenda deadline preparations presented by Dr. Diane Edison. Thank you President Perkins uh, Dr. Ely members of the board I know this is what you've all been waiting for all night uh, we've packed the house so we can uh, so we can hear this um, just consistent with our implementation uh, process, uh, the uh, update 118 or the updates include vantage points, explanatory notes, uh, and local policy comparisons um, in, the, uh, in the update and in the packet to help trustees uh, understand proposed policy revisions. Uh, policy updates encompass state board rules and other changes in the law uh, affecting SCU CISD uh, as well as refinements to local policies. Uh, the Board of our Trustees are required to adopt all um, revised legal policies that are associated with the update uh, and then review local uh, to make the determination on whether they want to accept the TASB recommendation 
um, or do something uh, different in that regard. Uh, we had 12 um, <coughs> local policies that were a part of Update 118. We had Mr. Finley and Ms. Evans join us uh, last Thursday to review these on uh, behalf of the board. Um, of the 12, uh, you can see here that I think 10 of them um, we recommended that you uh, to, to accept the TASB recommendation. I do want to point out just a couple for you that, uh, that differ. Um, one of those is, uh, you should have it in your packet, uh, CQB. Um, what you see in purple, wildcat purple, is, nobody got that, come on, <laughs> Whew, um, is what revisions that we're recommending um, uh, to be made. You can see in CQB uh, local, we um, stayed consistent with the red redaction, blue being additions, uh, green, if you see those, the, that was moved around, and then the purple were things that we implemented. We felt that we needed to ensure that each employee comp completed cybersecurity training annually. All right, and then in um, DFE local, uh, we made some revisions to that policy that you can see in purple, and this has to do with who can accept uh, a res uh, resignation. And so we changed some, struck some wording there and changed some wording uh, so that if a supervisor receives a resignation, then that is immediately sent to the superintendent uh, for him to be able to sign off on that resignation. It's pretty much what, we've, what we're currently doing. Uh, we'd like to keep that practice. I would be happy to go through any of the other local policies for you, or I'm sure uh, Ms. Evans can probably go through all of them for us as well. <laughs> Just kidding, I wouldn't do that to you. If Mr. Finley was here, he would go through all of them. <laughs> Any questions on update 118 policies? I do want to review BE local with you as well. Good, okay. So uh, BE local um, is a policy that we've looked at. By the way, 118 we brought before you uh, in November uh, for a discussion item, and then BE local we brought in uh, December as a discussion item. And basically, uh, looking at this policy, it aligns. We want to ensure that, we, uh, that our policy aligns our procedures and our practices. Um, what it does is give some specifics on board members' requests to have items placed on the board agenda uh, for the meeting. Uh, what we've looked at, we looked at various districts, some from just whoever wants to put it on there can put it on there to you can throw it out to the board and they have to vote in order to get it on there. What we're re recommending is that if two members, uh, two board members, want something on the agenda, then as the agenda is being prepared by uh, the superintendent and the board president, that it would be on there. Uh, for that to come off, the board president would not have the authority to, to, to pull that off unless one of those members said, you know what, never mind, we're good, we don't need it on there. The other thing, it gives some specific timelines associated with how long you have to, uh, to hear that or to discuss that with the board. For instance, if you, that next agenda is just packed and it's not going to get the attention that it needs, you could push that off to uh, that next board me meeting, but 60 days would be the limit um, on that one. And we would like to bring that change, uh, recommendation of change to you as well. Those changes where we, uh, where we made the recommendation um, are known as, e um, as uh, not X policies. Yeah, I'm sorry, X policies rather than A and B, which are what comes from, from TASB. Any questions? I move the Board of Trustees approve the TASB local localized policy manual update 118 affecting legal and local policies and policy BE local. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Oh. We have a motion and a second from uh, Mr. Swart that are there, is there any further discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. The motion passes 6-0. noted that I have spread out and taken up two people's place here. <coughs> <coughs> it did. 
<laughs> it didn't take that's right. It didn't take long. <laughs> Ed and I might have issues when he comes back. <laughs> Number two, request for board approval of the 2022-2023 school calendar presented by Dr. Damon Ezra. Thank you again, uh, President Perkins, Dr. Ely, members of the board. Uh, the calendar drafts are created and ultimately voted on uh, to make a recommendation by the District Improvement Committee for board approval. The school calendar enables the district to establish days of instruction, operation, and contract days of employees, including any time required for staff development, planning and preparation, and continued education, uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise by law. Um, as we are a district of innovation, it allows our districts to, to start prior, if that's one of the exceptions that we have, uh, start prior to the fourth Monday uh, of, uh, of August, and so we have uh, continued to exercise those things. Uh, a couple of things, or a few things that, that go into the consideration of building a school calendar. Um, one of them was the 180 days of instruction, which was mentioned earlier. Mr. Prusky talked about that we were able to, to get that additional day school year funding, half a day funding. Uh, for up uh, for the, the number of days that we had uh, for sure that came out to about two hundred forty five two hundred fifty thousand dollars it basically paid for K through five summer learning uh, for us in, in regards to that and then also some things to look at uh, and these were also reiterated by the committee is looking for professional development um, going to a 180 day calendar had limited us on some of our professional de development because we added more instructional days uh, and then one of the things that's always important to our committee is to ensure that we're honoring holidays that are important to our community, Veterans Day being uh, an, an excellent example um, uh, of that. So the other couple of other things to take in consideration as we go through this, uh, the, the calendar is also dictated by 187 day teacher or campus staff contract that we have to, we have to get either 180 days or less into that 187 uh, based on our contracts. And so I want to just kind of take you through some of these things as we worked on the con uh, calendar development of that. We started back in October, started off with a 3-2-1, looked at our current calendar, what are the three things that, that we like, what are two things that we want to look at, and what's something, one thing that we really may need to take in consideration uh, moving forward. Some of the things we shared with the, the 180 days, the professional development, and the holidays were what um, kind of rung out of, of that one. Uh, we take that information and then start making kind of drafts and then we take it back to the committee for feedback and then we come back and edit it and we take it back to the committee for feedback and come back and, and edit it. Um, like Ms. Siever and Ms. Evans were able to, to be a part of DIC uh, last week uh, when we brought that to them and Ms. Siever and I believe Mr. Perkins uh, saw it from October on uh, throughout that development. So just wanted to show some of the things on the, on the, on the draft calendars. Um, August 5th was the first day for, for teachers on both of those. Uh, September 5th is Labor Day, student staff holiday. Veterans Day is a student staff holiday. Uh, November, uh, the, the Thanksgiving break was a student staff holiday, and that was one of the discussions we really wanted to, the committee wanted to leave that as, a, as just a, a pure staff student holiday rather than, uh, than anything else. Uh, December 16th, end of the first semester, um, that's something that has been real important to us in trying to, especially from the high school, secondary, but especially the high school is finishing the semester prior to the uh, Christmas or winter break uh, beginning. Um, then you can see the winter break, 19th through the 30th, uh, Martin Luther King Day on the 16th, February 20th, the student staff holiday and a bad weather day. So if we were having to make up a day, that would be one of them that we would look at. Spring break, um, uh, being a student staff holiday, we talk about the importance of coordinating that with our dual credit providers. So uh, we work with Alamo Colleges. We look at, they typically have theirs built out uh, quite in advance. And so we look at their calendars. We do look at other district calendars to see if it aligns, but we really work with our, with our partners in regards to that. Um, and then Good Friday actually moves up a week uh, for this next year. And then end of second semester, uh, May 26th and May 30th, which is the day after uh, Memorial Day being a, an, another uh, bad weather makeup day. 
Uh, both of the drafts that we looked at or that we created had 187 uh, days for teacher contracts, which we mentioned. Uh, both of them meet the 75,600 minutes of instruction uh, required by the states. Both provide flex slash trade opportunities. Uh, and what that is, is, is as you looked at the calendars, the, the yellow that have a, a triangle in them, those are days where teachers can um, utilize that and utilize staff development in the summer and get credit for that um, and, and have that opportunity to take that off. And we'll go over more of that in, in just a moment. And then also nine early release days for afternoon staff, PD and PLC. Uh, we brought those back. Um, that was very important to uh, the, the committee members as well. Oh. Uh, some of the differences or the differences when you look at the, the two calendars, and by the way, A2 and D2 are just, that was a revision of A and a revision of D. We actually had A, B, C, D, and we narrowed that down with our committee. A2 is the, is the calendar draft that provides us 180 days of instruction, uh, qualifies us for the additional day school year, uh, ADSY, uh, currently used for summer learning. And again, that was about almost $250,000. Uh, that paid for primarily pretty much k uh, through five uh, instruction during our summer learning program. Draft D2 is 176 days um, of instruction. Uh, we're not required to have days unless we want the 180 to meet that criteria. We're required to have those minutes, as we mentioned. I uh, just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. Uh, draft A2, seven st uh, staff PD, professional development work days. D2 has 11 of those built in. Uh, August 1st being the first day of instruction on A2, and I put August 15th or 16th first day of instruction on D2 uh, because that was that's where we looked at um, the, at the last meeting. They said, "Can we can we massage a couple of days?" So we just put that on there as a possibility. First day of instruction on oh. draft A2 is. August 11th. I believe you said August 1st. Oh, did I? I'm yeah, sorry. I just didn't want to panic <laughs> I'm sorry. anybody who was just kind of uh, listening and not looking. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just, thank you for paying attention, Dr. Ely. And Ms. Thomas, I appreciate y'all catching that. And, and Mr. Perkins, thank you so much as well. Uh, and I'm not going to promise that that won't be the other, the only mistake that, uh, that I make in this. October 10th, uh, being that flex or exchange day uh, on, ca on draft D, October 10th and 11th. And again, what that means is, um, you know, when I'm in the summer and I've, I've had, you know, several weeks off, I can choose a type of staff development that I want to, or along with my principal, we're choosing the type of staff development uh, that's important, or there may be something specifically related, related to the district, like the reading academies, uh, those type things, where I can earn that and then take that day off. Part of that on both calendars, we were trying to have a period in there in October uh, that, that we could have that three, day, three to four day weekend. Uh, for students and staff. Uh, that's a long stretch when you look from Labor Day uh, to Veterans Day uh, without any, any, any uh, days off other than weekends. That was one thing that we really uh, tried to build in there as well. And then you can see on draft A2, uh, the first Monday back <clears throat> on January the 2nd uh, would be a staff PD PLC day. And then on D2, uh, the possibility of looking at an additional uh, flex exchange day <clears throat> or on January 2nd or 3rd start that staff PD PLC um, day on that on that Monday and, and the reason it says again two or three just like uh, above it said uh, on the start dates maybe the 15th or 16th those are the two days that we talked about uh, moving around and playing with uh, based on just the feedback that we got from last week. So I um, wanted to share some responses that we, that we got back. And by and large, uh, you know, these, these two drafts, I think for the most part, the committee um, said, you know, we can take either one of them. Uh, there's advantages uh, to one over the other in this area and, and, and likewise in the other groups. So uh, it says, you know, I really like uh, one, uh, the break, the two flex days in October, uh, providing a much needed break, extra PD days at the beginning of school is, a, is another complaint I've heard over the last two years. I like the idea of additional money for ADSY uh, and starting school on a Thursday. That was a big one. We, <laughs> the, the staff really did not want to start school on a Monday. A they said any other day of the week <laughs> except Monday. Uh, and so, again, that was some of the revisions that we talked about in D2. Um, another comment was 180 days for the grant are needed. That's additional day school year funding. Uh, and that additional funding <clears throat> from the added instruction was the deciding factor uh, for this person and who they represent. Uh, if you remember, our, D our DIC representatives are representatives from those that have either elected or selected them 
uh, to be a part of the process. So um, <clears throat> some of the other things just about the process in general, we ask for feedback on, okay, take us from October to here. We like the calendar input format throughout the month uh, leading up to our vote. I like being a part of this process. Uh, uh, and, and by the way, this, this we're taking exactly what it was off of what the feedback was. So uh, both calendars are great options. I really like the flex days, and it would be great if we could shorten the process so we could start the second semester knowing uh, the calendar uh, as part of that process. So without any further ado, the recommendation that the DIC uh, voted on and is making is uh, calendar draft A2. Uh, this was a pretty tight race this year, and again, I think that had to do with uh, the differences in the calendars and, and w the, what it offered, but also the, the overall um, kind of thought was we could go with either one of these. I slightly prefer this one, uh, but you can see that's A2. You, have, you guys have copies of each of the two drafts, and I will be happy to answer any questions. So I, I think some of the... Uh, really good discussion revolved around the beginning of the school year and why many felt it was important or they really liked the 11th and they had some really good thought behind that both at the elementary and the secondary level can you walk us through that sure um, that's something i think we've done the last several years and it really uh, the big part of that was it allows us to come back two days kind of figure everything out get everything signed and do all those kind of things um, it allows then for a weekend for everybody to recover <laughs> so that next Monday, we're really ready to, to kick it off and go. The other thing that was mentioned is for some of our courses, our students may get information that they need for those classes, and it gives the parents a little bit of time uh, to go out that weekend or the first few days to get that before the Monday uh, classes begin. They know that's just a, that, you know, that first week's a long week for everybody. So having those two days, getting everything kind of solid and going, uh, schedule changes and everything else, and then coming back on that Monday the 15th on this one and being able to, to really get going and get cranking on that. Yes, and I, you know, just with the elementary, I, I think at our table there was a discussion uh, with the elementary teachers that said, you know, these kids come in when they come in on Monday, mm -hmm. and by Wednesday they're drunk. They're drunk. Yes. We're talking the kinder, the first, the second. They just can't make it to the end of the week. Yes. And so doing a Thursday, starting on a Thursday, was really a much better idea for them. And just the whole idea of being able to, uh, with the secondary level, to be able to get some school supplies, you know, before the, uh, two days in and start the next week on a Monday with everything they need was, was another plus. Correct. I think that when we look at this calendar, I think a lot of thought went into what that uh, the ADSY provides for our district. Um, that was a lot of the, that drove a lot of that conversation uh, in regards to uh, in regards to this calendar. Uh, Wayne shared over the course of the next few summers what has been allotted uh, with some of our under uh, other funding uh, mechanisms um, as we move forward and we continue to work um, on. Uh, you know, some of the loss, some of the learning loss that, is, that has happened um, over the past couple of years. I'd just like to jump in just real quick uh, and address that. Uh, Ms. Kovacs and I also met with uh, Superintendent Student Cabinet and uh, was a little shocked, but they were really in favor of the Thursday start as well um, mm -hmm. for some of the things that were just reasons that were just thrown out. Um, while starting on a Monday doesn't preclude us from being able to do this, I, I really see us being able to start on a Thursday allows those first two days for us as uh, teaching staff and campus staff to work with our kids and really begin that um, relationship development process. Yes, there will be a little bit of classroom expectations, but really take those two days to, to process the summer, the new school year, um, get to know each other, um, and I, I think that will be hugely important for us uh, as we start the school year next year. And on either calendar, we, we were able to accomplish some of those other things. Uh, we added, I think, five additional half days that can be utilized for that PD or PLC time on our campuses. That October 10th day, that that ex that exchange or flex day, that kind of generate that's generated more and more interest over the the few years. Uh, several districts around us do that. Um, you know, we would work what process we want to to ensure that 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 is being met. But that giving that opportunity, one, for, for that really um, good quality professional uh, development, but two, giving that three-day break, and actually the Friday before that on the 7th is, a, is an early release day for students, but it would give our staff that three-day break um, in the middle of October, again, to cover that long gap from Labor Day to Veterans Day. 
Most of the other months have something like that uh, built in. October was the one that didn't. And so we were able to accomplish those two things on both calendars, uh, but you can see um, on this one. I think one of the important things that was discussed, and you, you, you touched on it with the, the PLCs, w as far as um, the half days, it allows the teachers for, if they have any required professional development that they have to do, like the reading academies, that this would give them some flexibility as well, to be able to do it during this time. Yeah, what they were real adamant about was, can we ensure that we designate what days are what? Um, in regards to PLC or PD, campus PD, district PD, and so we will work um, uh, along with others to, to ensure that we can do that to the best of our abilities. <coughs> Any other discussion? move that the Board of Trustees approve the 2022-2023 school year calendar as recommended by the administration. I second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those, yes, go ahead. I, as a parent with a student in the district, like the Thursday as well for supplies, especially as an older student, not having the supplies ahead of time like the younger grades, just having that time and not having to rush and fight for school so I appreciate it the Thursday as well yeah and, and I'd like to one I'd like to thank just um, I failed to do this our, our district improvement committee there was a lot of thoughtful reflection and conversation uh, that were that involved over these last three to four months uh, in, in developing that calendar so they put a lot of work into really taking a look at, at both of those options as they narrowed down um, and, and, you know, both of them, it, it was going to be a win with, with either calendar that came out. Um, draft A2 is the one that, that rose a little bit above, uh, above that. So, again, just a special thanks to uh, our, DIC, our district improvement committee members um, and several of us uh, ELT members and cabinet members that helped lead some of those conversations and table talk. Yes, we have a motion and a second. The only thing I just want to add is the uh, the composition of the DIC, just for the folks that are listening. We do have parents that sit on that committee. We do have community members that sit on that committee that give input as well. So this is kind of a cross-section that everyone gets some input into. It, it is. It has to be two-thirds made up of teachers. Uh, but this year we also, and we, and we shared it with you guys, brought to you guys as far as the makeup, we did it a little bit differently to ensure that uh, we made sure that we had a, a nurse on there, somebody in a nursing position that could go back and work with that, an assistant principal, a principal, a counselor, um, several different positions like that throughout the district. Um, so it wasn't just random if they were able to be selected by their campus or whatever. Every, every campus had at least one uh, teacher, and then we did some at-large positions on some of, those, some of those other things to really ensure that we had representation on the, on the district improvement committee, is, like you said, as well as community members, parents, uh, and business uh, members of our community. All right, and s not seeing any more discussion, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. Any opposed, same sign, motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. everyone doing we've still got four items before our natural break we okay press on if, if, if you need to get up get up <coughs> next is the request for board action approval of facilitator for the 2022 through 2026 strategic plan development presented by Kelly Kovacs as mrs. Kovacs gets prepared to do that I just want to say uh, thank you uh, to her, Dr. Edwards um, and the board for um, going through the interviews with three um, really good groups uh, for us to be able to work with. I think any of the three will be uh, w w would be good options for us. Uh, we do have a recommendation, and as we get to the end, Mrs. Kovacs will be making the administration's recommendation. Uh, yes, so as you all know, we've been meeting the last couple of weeks to interview three potential uh, companies that could help lead us in our strategic planning process for um, the 22 through 26 or 27 school years. Um, we have interviewed N2 Learning, 
Cambrian and Engage to Learn, um, each of which um, had their own kind of take on how many committee members and timeline and those sorts of things. So we wanted to give you all an opportunity to discuss that um, at, uh, at your will. Um, and in addition, uh, we do have a recommendation from our side if you're interested in hearing that. Ready to hear it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Please. <laughs> okay. Uh, our recommendation is to move forward with Engage to Learn. Uh, they have an opportunity to um, lead us in a lot of areas that we would like to um, discuss. Uh, of course, the, the goals and beliefs and some of the traditional pieces that have been a part of our strategic planning process, <coughs> in addition to um, the work that they can do for us in terms of um, an engagement report, the profiles of a learner, profile of an educator, profile of a leader. And um, they were the one who also were, um, <coughs> part as part of their work, will help with leadership training in order to implement the plan. Thoughts, discussion? We need to have a motion first, don't we? Th that would be just fine. Thank you. I move the Board of Trustees authorize the superintendent or his designee to enter into a contract with C Engage to Learn uh, for the development of the SCUT ISD uh, strategic plan beginning in spring 2022. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? What separated the first from the second? And who was second? Um, we, uh, th I would say that um, Engage to Learn well outdistanced the uh, the other two. Uh, I would say for me, and I, we didn't do this as an executive leadership team, and do so. I'm just giving you mine. Uh, my second would have been uh, into learning. Uh, they do a lot of good work, including some work that they're doing with uh, SEC ISD at the point uh, uh, right now. Um, I, what I what what we liked about Engage to Learn is not that it's so scripted, but they do have a plan, uh, and they do have several deliverables um, that uh, that they could point to that we could see examples uh, on other uh, in other districts and on other websites. Um, into learning, one of the great things about that company is they are they're very much customized to the district. But in this strategic planning process, um, we we looked for a little bit more of a understanding of what exactly we'd be taking through, rather than, than having more of an emergent nature out of that. I'll just add uh, one of the things that was great about Engage to Learn was that um, they provide up to two summits and seven focus groups as part of their work. Um, and to learning, we could do that. It was an add-on, uh, and Cambrian really didn't do it at all. They were, they said, if you want to do that, you can do it on your own prior to the process. And uh, we really want to make sure that we have lots of voices um, helping to at least inform our our work. So, I think that's another advantage. Remind me, Engage to Learn had uh, how many um, community days? Theirs was uh, four total days, two consecutive, and then two additional okay. that could be split up. Okay. And they had the um, summit with the student center, correct? That's correct. They also, uh, I believe, requested eight students so that there's at least one student per group as part of their work as well. Uh, and they also had a healthy group uh, as far as like how many uh, community members they wanted. I thought that was pretty good. They did have a very good presentation. I mean, most of them did, but I, I, theirs was, I, I did like it. I did like what they presented. I did like that they had a lot that they were, as far as like, like when we wanted to see results or, you know, we wanted to carry things a little bit further, they had, they had those options. further discussion seeing none all those in favor please raise your right hand motion passes 6-0 next we have request for board action reapproval of Guadalupe appraisal district parking lot expansion project presented by Wayne Fusco 
Yes, good evening again. Uh, this is an item that was acted on back in October of uh, last year, uh, but due to some other circumstances and legal requirements by the Guadalupe County Appraisal District, it's being brought forth before the board again. As a reminder, uh, the Board of Directors of the Guadalupe County Appraisal District respectfully request this item be placed on our board agenda no later than January 18th, 2022, to approve a resolution of the proposed parking lot expansion. Uh, with us tonight, we have Mr. Peter Snadden, uh, Chief Appraiser of the Southern District, here to help us with any questions that are specific, as some of us were not here for that item, and coming to you again, it's kind of strange. So we're going to hear it from Mr. Snadden if you have any questions regarding this project. Thank you for being with us, Mr. Snadden, and waiting three hours and six minutes to be you with know, us. It just tells me how good this is going to be. This is going to feel good. But uh, now the first time we did this, um, the code, tax code has a real strict policy. It has to be within 30 days, three-fourths of our taxing units that we service um, have to approve this parking lot expansion. Anything, anytime we do anything to the facility that we occupy, essentially it's an undivided interest owned by all the entities. So we have to get your approval before we start either expanding or, in this case, adding a parking lot. Um, so we didn't meet that threshold. Um, we just first time doing it, I assumed everybody was on our clock, you know, and uh, as it turned out, <laughs> it, that's not the case. So we uh, put a little bit more planning into this one, and uh, I believe we're going to we're going to hit that three fourths and we'll be able to get this parking lot um, project started. We currently have about 44 spaces and we have 37 employees. So you can imagine during protest season when we got about 16,000 protests coming through, uh, safety becomes an issue. And um, so this is something we're trying to uh, improve on before the protest season begins in April. Uh, it'll be pretty close at this point, but um, we'll do our best to get it done with the, uh, the support of all the entities such as yourself. But uh, that's all I had. I appreciate you all giving me the time to hang out for a little while and see exactly what's going on in this thing. My kids go to the school district, so I felt good to listen to my daughter. <laughs> Thank you again for waiting to be with me. Yeah. Thank you so much. Any other questions? I move the Board of Trustees approve the Church Cittler Universal City ISD resolution as presented, granting approval of the uh, proposal set forth by the Guadalupe Appraisal District Board of Directors received December 28, 2021 as per 6.051B of the Texas Property Tax Code. Uh, did I get it? Oh. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. Any opposed? Motion passes 6-0. Item number five, request for board action, solicitation for employees benefit risk management consulting services, RFP number 22-001, Victor, presented by Jesse Luna and Linda Kane. Good evening. <clears throat> Back in the fall, we uh, requested to go out for a bid on our uh, benefits consulting uh, services. We had... Um, uh, partnered with Gallagher about five years ago, <coughs> and they helped us with um, benefits consulting the last five years, and also really helped us move from our fully insured product um, to self-insured on our health care. And um, as a best practice, we felt like we should go to market and just see what's out there is again. And um, we were able to receive back three bids on that. Um, a committee of folks reviewed the bids, um, some HR staff members along with some other department leaders were involved in this process and we reviewed the offerings um, from those other, uh, the three companies. And so based on the summary of the evaluations and actually what we felt like was the best value to the district, we are recommending um, to um, stay with Gallagher Benefit Services as our consultant. I move the Board of Trustees approve the proposal of the vendor listed as for solicitation 21-016V to provide stop loss insurance coverage. Uh, I apologize. Uh, 
made an error on that selection of that slide, that motion. Uh, after the words, as per solicitation, it should actually be 22-001B for employee benefit risk management consulting services. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to amend the motion to say I move that the Board of Trustees approve the proposal of the vendor listed as per, per solicitation 22-001B to, to provide employee benefit and risk management consulting services. Yes, that's great. <laughs> as presented. I second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. Item number six, request for board action approval of changes to the board operating procedures and that's presented by yours truly. Do you have a packet? If it pleases the board, I could take you through the changes. They are, uh, they have been highlighted. Um, if you'll go to the, uh, the second page, the back of the first page, under duties of the board to govern the district, in order to govern effectively, the board should, uh, we change this to, should not take action on an item without first hearing the recommendation from the superintendent. That's why we had a recommendation here. Um, so, I, uh, so that we would make sure we were following of uh, what would ultimately be the updated board operating procedures. Um, flipping <coughs> to, that's one, two, three, four, page five, uh, under where it says board meetings, the board has already, were, uh, has already uh, worked this evening to amend board policy BE local. Uh, and the highlighted text that you see there uh, brings that into uh, line with our now policy BE local says any two board members may request to the board president or superintendent any item they wish to have placed on a future agenda. In reviewing the preliminary agenda before posting, the board president shall ensure that any topics the board uh, or any two individual board members have requested to be addressed are either on that agenda or scheduled for deliberation at an appropriate time in the near future, not to exceed 60 days. Uh, moving on to page seven, where we're talking about public comments uh, at regular board meetings, you'll recall last month we had spirited discussion um, <coughs> regarding what could or could not be um, uh, encouraged, discouraged, or mandated in regards to speech. Uh, if you will look there towards the two-thirds of the way down the page, the board strongly, we've changed the language here, uh, to the board strongly discourages inappropriate comments on individual personnel or students uh, in public session. Okay. Moving on, continuing to flip. Um, when we look at the bottom of the page, uh, across from training requirements, the, the <coughs> excuse me, the board, uh, the sorry, the table on training requirements at the bottom of the page regarding air travel, our mileage, mileage reimbursement to and from the airport will be limited to the cost of round trip mileage from the Central Administration Building here to the San Antonio International Airport, and we added or Austin Bergstrom International Airport, since so many people do fly out of that. Uh, we will need to be working with our folks in finance to understand the ramifications of that. Um, flipping, flipping uh, to the third to last page, uh, we <coughs> struck a paragraph that said, in addition, individual board members may request report discussion items during the designated time allotted for this purpose, the regular monthly board meeting, or by submitting a request in writing to the superintendent's office. That's the next part of requesting board items. Uh, and so we struck that there. Uh, and ended up changing it on the uh, uh, agenda moving forward. Um, moving to board advocacy, second paragraph, any individual trustee has been censured by the board. Um, we struck who has been uh, indicted for any felony charges or has been found to engage in ethical practices, should not advocate for or represent the board in the activities below without the advanced discussion of the appropriateness of the activity by the board. And finally, if you go to the last page, we simply struck um, in the uh, advocacy with other elected officials, we struck the number of times per year uh, for each one of those other government entities. I move that the Board of Trustees approve the change to the board operating procedures as presented. We have a 
a motion and a second from Dan. <coughs> Any further discussion? Yes, <laughs> there he is. Um, I noted under board advocacy, we had struck who has been indicted for any felony charges, but then, in fact, I don't agree with striking it, but uh, it's also listed under board training requirements, unless approved in advance by the board, no individual trustee who has been sent to by the board or who has been indicted for any felony charges and so on. Uh, that's under board training requirements. Uh, there's no page number. It just, it starts with role and authority of individual board members. Yeah, and then the second paragraph says approved. Yeah, in the, um, <coughs> one, two, three, fourth paragraph. Fourth paragraph under? Under board training. I'm just saying th those strike are. Strike who has been indicted for any felony. I'm not charges. saying to strike them, though. I just pointed out that, <laughs> that it, the exact phrase is in there twice. And frankly, as the newly elected board member, I don't feel that I can write that. I've looked at um, other districts' ethical standards in <coughs> these types of situations, and they do have that in there. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up. Um, I feel like we should do everything possible to maintain ethical standards and show students, show model for students, teachers, um, parents, and community members that we're serious. thoughts? Well, as far as the uh, board training requirements, so I was I was president at the time when some of this came about. We were, it was my understanding that the board could not limit past work, could not limit the actions of a duly elected individual. That was my understanding. That was going to be my point too. Is I thought we ran into pr legal problems of we we may have said it in our policies, but we had no tool to enforce it. That's exactly what I was given. A, you know, attorney-client privilege is just my understanding. So I don't know if we need to get clarification from a board of board attorney or what. But yes, that's what I'm recommending. So I think we discussed this last month, like um, as far as it being legal, it's not. Like we can't, so the whole idea of us punishing someone before they've even been like uh, convicted of a crime, that actually isn't right. Like we do actually have a 14th and a 5th amendment that talks about due process and the whole idea of due process is that you can't, you should not punish someone unless they've been, it's the whole idea of being innocent until proven guilty. And so we've taken that, or not we, but this whole idea of this in here means that they're guilty until proven innocent, which is the complete opposite of what our Constitution tells us. Well, to me, it's the same thing. Uh, who has been indicted for a felony charge or who has been found guilty of engaged in un unethical practices? Isn't that the same thing? Well, Because that's unethical, both of them. But indicted is just somebody accused of yeah, yeah. That's so, and, and that's the problem we run into. Yeah, I'm aware. I just feel like we should have our attorney look at it before we put it out there as our board operating procedure. Well, to be consistent, if you're going to do one, you probably need to do the other. Yeah. Yeah. How can you leave in the fourth exactly. paragraph and then keep the other? Yeah. So, does the motion need to be amended because we need a vote on it? We can finish the discussion and amend the motion, or we can send it to committee. Or we can just <laughs> vote on it, right? It, it doesn't have to be. You can vote. The, you can vote the motion up or down, if you want to. Yes, you can vote it up or down. Mm -hmm. 
doesn't have to be against the people of Ireland. Uh, do, who, who made the motion? I rank the motion. Did you make every motion? I did. Oh. <laughs> These are all for a record tonight. All right. Um, uh, would you like to ask her if she w is willing to um, amend the motion or not? Can you amend the motion to include the two paragraphs? Simon, as the Board of Trustees approve the changes to the Board Operating Procedures, as well as, what is, do we know what page that is? Uh, we don't, but it's um, striking who has been indicted for any felony charges under board training requirements. Under board training requirements, we would make the paragraph the same as the um, other one that we just discussed as presented. We have a motion, an amended motion and a second. Any further discussion? Well, did that, does that mean we don't get the attorney to look at it before we vote on it? We've had the attorney look at it in back when Robert was president. And that's when we learned we couldn't do anything with that statement because it nobody had been convicted of anything. So we can, we have a motion to second, we can vote and we can vote accordingly. We could still ask for a legal. Well, I, ju I just want to make sure it's legal before I vote for it. Everybody has their you know, choice to make, and that's my that's right. my choice. Because if I'm going to take my name, and as it says there, trustee, we're called trustees, which means we have to keep the trust of everyone involved. So that's where I'm coming from. Well, we can. We can vote and then, but I know that it can't, we can't, we can't hold somebody who's indicted or something, we can't censor somebody that's just been being indicted. But what we I have, that's well, not what I'm so saying. We, so we've scratched that. Yeah, that's not what I'm saying at all. So well, you're, you're already saying the attorney can't look back in the chamber. That's why we scratched it. That's why it's being scratched. Right, so it's. So legally. So how did it get in there then? If you look. If you talk to an attorney, that's not. We didn't change it. We didn't change it. We just learned we couldn't do it. And now we're changing it. Okay. But so, can you can you do both? Can we vote? But can we still get an attorney to look at it? No, can, no matter which way the vote goes, in order to satisfy a board member's um, need for further information, we can still sort of revisit a legal opinion in closed session or something to that effect and get a clarification. I think as a board member, she does deserve clarification yeah. one way or the other. Yes, a you new, can. A new board trustee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So we have a motion and we have a second. That's pretty clear right. what the motion and second is. And so you can call Agreed. for the vote whenever you're ready to right. do that. And yes, Mr. Brestbrook, you, you can ask the administration to bring some information forward, which we'd be happy to do. Further discussion? All those in favor of the amendment as it's currently stated with making the paragraphs the same in training and in the last one, please raise your right hand. Any opposed? No, there are two. Five, five to one. Five to one. Uh, yes, I've raised my hand. Motion passes five to one. I'm not even sure that's the most convoluted uh, motion I've ever heard, but that's right. It's good. <laughs> I think it'll work. <laughs> I think that dog will help. It did get edited a couple times. This board will now adjourn into closed session. Pursuant to the following section of the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Governance Code Section 551.074, authorization to deliberate the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee or to hear a complaint or charge against an officer or employee. The time is 924.